We do not have a pastor, but in light of everything that's going on in today's world, especially overseas, uh, I'd like to take about 60 seconds uh, for each one of us to have the opportunity to lift those communities up in prayer. And then, ma'am, you can lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Meeting of the Odessa City Council, March 7, 2022, to order. First up, agenda approval. I'll entertain a motion. Make that motion. Second. I have a second. Vote is unanimous, so moved. All righty. We have uh, tonight, first up, under item one, uh, Destin High School, our beloved principal, Miss Christine Crickshank. Would you like to come up to the podium, ma'am? Good evening. I am Christine Cruikshank. I am the principal of Destin High School. I want to thank the council for um, having us visit with you this evening. It was about five years ago that the council tasked what became the founding board of Destin High School with determining the feasibility of a high school in Destin. This group worked hard to research, plan, and fundraise for the first high school in the history of Destin and even overcame the year of COVID and other things that kept it from happening sooner than it should have maybe. Um, this, their, their vision became a reality on August 10th, 2021, when Dustin High School opened its doors to students in grades nine through 11 for the very first time. We asked to be on the agenda tonight to update the council members and the mayor on what has been happening at DHS since the doors opened. We're there, we're moving, we're moving around every day, but you don't get inside. So we wanted to share with you a little bit of the progress we've made since August. Um, we are currently the home to almost 300 students, nine through 11. Uh, our first graduating class will graduate in 2023. That'll be a graduating class of approximately 55 students. Um, we have completed our first application period for the 2022-23 school year and have received between the first and the second application period, which ends on Friday, over 150 applications for year two. So we are moving along. Uh, we will be at capacity and more than likely a waiting list. And uh, this particular group of applicants is almost all destined addresses. And that is very, very exciting to me to see that. Uh, we have a talented, amazing group of teachers, staff, and coaches uh, that are working with Destin High School. We're at about 25 total staff members, but you would think with everything we've got going, we have 100 people in that building doing it. Uh, but we have about 25. Uh, we have a varied curriculum. Am I pressing the right button? We have, thank you, we have a varied curriculum that offers students a wide range of academic classes. Um, everything from advanced or honors and advanced and regular classes and next year we will be adding nine advanced placement classes to the curriculum for the upper level students. Uh, we currently offer four career academies, biomedicine, 
uh, marketing and entrepreneurship, fishing and cybersecurity, and those programs will grow. The plans are right now for more certificate for more classes and academies that can earn industry certification for these students. That is the goal of our career academies is industry certification. So students that leave us have some sort of certification whether they choose to go to college or enter the workforce. We of course also try to focus on the needs of the Destin community. That being said, we are looking at offering and it's in the curriculum guide culinary one as well as hospitality and tourism in the fall. Oh, thank you. There they are, thank you. Um, hospitality and tourism and culinary. And again, looking at the needs of the community um, and also knowing that all of our students may not be college ready, we want them to come out career ready. So carpentry, electrical, HVAC, construction, small engine, small marine engine repair, environmental marine science are all in the future plans. Uh, based on student interest. And again, our goal is, and the mission of Destin High School, one of them is to have our students leave being productive, ready citizens, and hopefully keep that here in Destin and locally. Uh, we wanna thank the council for ma um, offering us and selecting us as Grand Marshal of the Destin Parade. That was great fun. And I think the community got to see a taste of everything we have to offer. Um, all of the things like the band, which is growing, the chorus and the musical program. The musical program just finished putting on its first full musical two nights last week, Disney High School Musical Junior. Um, and it was on the last night to a sold out show. So that was very, very exciting to see. Um, and seeing the students gelling and coming to support their, their peers, both in the, in the arts as well as in the athletics, is exciting to see as well. Um, and of course, the ever famous fishing class. Chorus, our leadership class, which is trying to form partnerships within the local community for um, community service opportunities. And so the teacher of that, um, as well as myself and board members are working to open those opportunities for our students to give back to the community. Uh, I tell the students regularly, we would not be here without the city of Destin and therefore we, we need to give back to the city of Destin and keep it local. Our art. Um, so our goal for the community is to be part of, or for the community is to be part of the school and our students in school to be part of the community. We want to be a force in Destin. You know, high school kids are a special group and they're kind of in between that adulthood and not quite their adulthood, um, but we want them to learn the responsibility to give back. Um, you have been so supportive of Destin High School and we do appreciate that. What we would like to see the City Council consider and to approve is a task force committee, much like the one that was formed to open Destin High School, to work with the school to see what cooperative projects together we can come up with. Um, with a council member serving on the task force, we would also have a direct member of the council in the know about all the amazing things taking place at Destin High School and on the needs of the school. I'd like to take a break and introduce Mr. Phil Dorn to kind of share with you some of the ideas uh, that we might have um, just kind of in the back of our minds, um, especially for the athletic program. He's the athletic director. So it's always hard following her, but I'll try to be uh, as impressive. Um, the thing that uh, is, uh, first of all, we want to thank you again for having us uh, here this evening and having an opportunity to talk with you. And, uh, one of the things we started at the beginning of the year with our students was the, the whole concept that we're one community and we're going to have to all work together to have the kind of programs we'd like to have at Destin High School and make this community proud of our students and our student athletes and our programs that represent us. So uh, we started the, the idea in athletics that we were all one team, uh, many sports, but all one team. But little did we know then that our interest was going to be exactly what we have right now, which is 22 sports, 11 boys and 11 girls. Uh, up and running. Our, our students are active and they are moving from sport to sport and in, in the best of ways. So we've got multi-sport students who are playing, um, you know, for our teams and are, are getting out there in the community. And so what that's done is created a need for 
um, compliant facilities, continue to help this program to grow, uh, try to meet the students' interests where they're at. And in order to do that, we've been able to partner with many of the uh, Destin community uh, facilities, uh, Coast Aquatics for swimming, Indian Bayou Golf Club for our golf team. Uh, we've had the opportunity to use Destin Tennis Club now at Seascape for t uh, tennis. And uh, those things are very exciting. Um, the city has been working with this as, as close as they can. We have softball playing at Morgan Park. Um, we have an opportunity to play our indoor sports at the uh, uh, Community Life Center at Destin United Methodist Church. And currently we're working with the city uh, very hard to try to build a, a compliant baseball facility at the elementary school. Although, uh, as many of you may be aware, we know Oakland schools eventually will take that property and uh, start to uh, build on that for an, an addition to that elementary school. So, um, you know, as we look forward, what we're asking the council to consider as you look at the vision and the strategy for our community, if you would uh, keep us in mind in that process and possibility of creating municipal facilities, you know, the, the vision of a, a stadium big enough to host uh, FHSA, you know, football, lacrosse, soccer, right here that the high school can use, but the community can use for all the community programs as well. Um, the idea that we, we know we need to build a gym. Um, I know at the last meeting I was at, there was a, a need brought up that we might need a second gym for park and recreation. So uh, some way maybe to, to partner resources to build a facility that both the city can use, the high school can use, and we can share scheduling and have the opportunity to represent the Destin community with the best of facilities for both the high school interscholastic athletics, but also parks and recreation in our city community. So um, as we feel the swell in our high school, I think the one thing that um, has really been apparent to myself and uh, had the fortunate um, opportunity to live in Destin for six years now, but uh, really feeling a community swell of support for what we're trying to do. And, um, and I think our students, our parents, our community, our school is going to continue to grow and represent this community. So anything we can do to help work with you or partner with you uh, in a vision going forward where we might be able to create something that uh, would be special for our community and have the ability to have our youth use it for both parks and recreation and, and the high school. That's um, really what we hope to be able to, to work with you towards that and, and towards those possibilities. So thank you very much for your time today. So again, we thank you. Are there any questions? You said you wanted to put together some sort of um, a, a team that uh, helps you and you would like a council member on that. I'd be very interested in helping you. So whenever you're ready to sit down and talk about setting up a team, I'll be more than happy to help. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any yeah. other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> it fits right into the city center plans we're going to talk about here in a little while. And I didn't set this up like that, by the way. <laughs> Me and Ms. Crick Shank and the athletic director had no communications whatsoever. Uh, item uh, item, item uh, number two, public comments. Um, just want to remind everybody that um, we do have a hearing tonight. Uh, so keep all your comments to anything on the, that's on the agenda or not on the agenda, but does not include uh, uh, our hearings. And you'll have three minutes when you come up, state your name and your uh, address. And I'll give you three minutes, about 15 seconds left. I'll ask you to quickly wind up your thoughts. And um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we don't call people out by name. If you want to say uh, the council or the mayor or you know the, the office that's being held, you can do that. Uh, if you don't, I'll hold you to account and ask you to uh, not be personal. That being said, I think I'll start, go right to left tonight, just throw everybody a curveball. Is anybody over here on this side of the room that would like to make a comment during the public comment period? I'm going to be like one of those sprinkler systems. Anyone here in the middle would like to come up? Come on up. State, hit the red button, state your name and your address.
My name is John Benton, 1055 Lincoln Street, Northeast Palm Bay. And I'm here, I just pulled in here from Arizona and I'm heading home and the reason why is Judge Crawford in Brevard County asked me to take my sign from the front of his courthouse and go after the person that caused the problem. And that day when I left, an attorney lost her job at Bogan Munns and Munns because of that sign. And that was the second time she's lost her job. The first time was in Cape Canaveral. So I came here and instead of bringing my signs here to, to your town, I did what the judge said and just came here and didn't bring those signs. He wanted me to cover up one of the words. I would not do it. And we were out in the courtyard with two cops and a doctor. But when he was leaving, he was barking at me. If I had a sign that said I was railroaded, he may hold it for me. I was in Cape Canaveral and I was accused of living in a warehouse and the warehouse that was next to me had a police officer from Cocoa Beach stripping out a car. He was up there as much as me and I was accused of living in my warehouse and I went to a code enforcement hearing and they called a witness after me and I told them I did not live in that warehouse. I did not tell them about the cop. Nobody knew but me and the deputies at night. The deputies did not come to that meeting. They used pictures that they took. Well, the attorney there referred to me as a cookie that crumbled while the board was voting. They mocked me, thought I was homeless because people were screaming into the mayor. Benton's living in his warehouse and code enforcement's not doing anything. Ten people lost their jobs. Mayor Randall's lost his job after 31 years as a mayor. First election, he lost. The city manager got fired because I went to city hall, city hall and held that sign like the judge asked me, didn't cover it. They trespassed me from every piece of property in there and the, and the commander, he couldn't believe they were trespassing. He said, I've never done this before. Well, they withdrew it back. So I'm she's working here and I found out why she did this and why she got away with it. And she had one thing in common with everybody that got fired, the mayor, her boss, the owner of the law firm, the city manager, the man that gave me the trespass order, all they have to do is give me a code reduction hearing. She would not let me defend myself in that meeting. He got up and threw me under the bus, accused me of living in there. The cops weren't there. I couldn't do anything, and I wasn't going to tell him the cop easy was in my unit. He's in Cocoa Beach. They didn't know until six months later when I came and I surprised Cape Canaveral. I am not going to live in a warehouse. It turns out that she had one thing in common with all of them. All those five, the trespassor, the mayor, the lost his job, everybody else, she had one thing in common, that they wouldn't call her out for not letting me defend myself. They laughed at me. She referred to me as a cookie that crumbled. They got a recording of it. Okay. And uh, Your her thing in common was they were all Jewish, and I'm a survivor of the Jew school, and I came forward in 1993, so I'm on their list, and that might be it, because I was doing it in that warehouse, sending it to the information to the judge. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and I hope I don't come back. Thank you, sir. Next up, anyone over here? Going once, going twice. I want to remind everybody that you can uh, have another opportunity for public comment at the tail end of the meeting. Seeing no further folks wanting to step up to the plate after that, I'll uh, <laughs> close the public comment period. All righty. Wow. All right, we got um, item number three. Thank you, second. sir. I have motion to approve in a second. Thank you. Vote is unanimous, so moved. Up next, we have a guest from the Choctaw Basin Alliance. Come on up, sir. And give us, ma'am, and give us your presentation. Hello. 
Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Jenna Kilpatrick, and I'm the program manager of our monitoring program at CBA, better known as Choctahatchee Basin Alliance. Today I'm going to be updating you on um, just a, a brief overview of who we are and why I'm here tonight, which is actually to give you a better understanding of how we work with the city of Destin, uh, what we do, and then what our water quality looks like, most importantly. Uh, so who are we? Uh, we are CBA, we're a nonprofit organization, and we are responsible for promoting swimmable, fishable waterways through monitoring, education, restoration, and research. Uh, where are we and, and where, how do we cover the area that we do? If you'll just take a brief look at that map, that's actually what we call our Choctahatchee watershed. And all those red dots are right down here in Choctahatchee Bay, uh, through our coastal dune lakes, out along, out along the ocean as well, and then all the way up the river up to Geneva, Alabama. So when we look at our watershed, we are actually looking at all the water that's coming down and draining into our bay. That's what we consider the Choctahatchee Basin, and that's where we start Serve. Um, we're actually really excited in some future projects to be more expanding more northeast up to those freshwater portions, working with partners across communities in the northeast portion of our watershed to ensure, of course, that our water is clean, healthy, and sustainable over time. So why am I here? Well, Destin uh, and CBA are actually in a great partnership through um, something that we call a Destin NPDES. And back in 2003, the city of Destin uh, began to take an agreement with the state um, in order to fulfill what we need to um, promote good water quality practices in our area. Um, and so that's where CBA stepped in. Through that particular program, um, in accordance with the state, we do, there is certain requirements that we do need to fulfill. And so CBA came in and said, let's, let's partner together in order to make sure all of those different uh, stipulations are covered. So largely what we're helping out with is um, a lot of education and outreach programs throughout the community to help, again, to maintain swimmable, fishable waterways and fulfill all the obligations that you're needed to do through uh, the NPDES program. Um, so we see this as a perfect partnership. It's been working out for quite, quite a few years now, so I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about what that looks like here tonight. So first off, uh, something that you do have to fulfill the requirement is to um, specify public education and outreach throughout our community. So first thing that we are going to be looking at is our uh, presentations that we do with school-aged children here. And that is a specific requirement, again, through that NPDES permit. Uh, so we actually have two different, very unique programs in our community with third grade and fifth grade students. Our first one at the top is called Grasses and Classes, and this works with our elementary age third and fifth grade students. We actually go into the classrooms, we teach them about storm water, about our local environment, our marine ecosystems here. And we actually provide them an opportunity to uh, nurture and care for native grasses, native shoreline grasses in the classroom throughout the year, as well as get hands-on education and interactive programs right in their own school systems. Um, so at the end of the year, they actually are able to come together, they bring the, the grasses that they've grown throughout the year, and they participate in a very unique field trip at a local restoration site. So CBA has quite a few restoration sites around our bay and community, most of them being local parks, where we'll actually go back over time and plant native grasses with students. Uh, this is a great opportunity for them because of course, not only do they get that opportunity to learn and to see and to understand the importance of uh, restoration activities, conservation activities in our area, but they're actually able to return to those parks over time with family and friends and then teach, teach their parents and friends all about what they're learning as well. So secondarily, we have another program for our middle school students, and that's called Dunes in Schools. And again, that's going to be specific to fifth through eighth grade students, where we're actually teaching them an additional curriculum. On top of stormwater, we're going into the dune ecosystems, having them grow a sea oats, and then be able to plant those out along our beaches as well. Again, the school year will end in a nice field trip, interactive programming, hands-on participatory learning, where they're able to plant those back into the dunes. 
So over time, actually this past uh, year, uh, we've had 161 Destin students that participated in two, uh, 2021 at Destin Middle School in our Dunes in Schools programs. Of course, due to COVID, everything has become a little bit more complicated with students and working in school systems. However, we were able to continue with a hybrid option. So giving teachers um, lessons and plans ahead of time, having them do it with the students, and then we were able to uh, engage our students with two field trips at the end of the school year, kind of bringing it all together and giving them that hands-on participatory learning and planting at the end of their, at the end of their time. Um, on average, we do serve one, over 1,400 1, students in Okaloosa County. That's every single year. And what's really unique in this is that actually 90 plus percent of all of those students have shown an academic gain from this programming that we have implemented in these schools. Uh, last but not least, I just wanted to share a personal testimony that we recently received uh, from a, an, a volunteer that, or an inquiry for someone that wanted to volunteer. And she actually said, the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance came to my elementary school and I got to participate in grasses and classes. I still remember that experience and love that experience. Um, and this is coming from a marine biology undergraduate student over at UWF that's now wanting to serve with us in a volunteer opportunity. I just thought that was really neat, seeing that come full circle. Uh, so some other um, unique opportunities we have at CBA and host throughout the city of Destin over the years. We do homeschool field trips, volunteer events, partner team building for any companies out there. Alternative spring breaks have actually been very unique and interactive with us in the past couple of years. Um, in addition, we also do a regular summer program at the Destin Library, where we do a very similar um, interactive learning experience as in the schools, but instead it's over the summer and offered to any kid that might want to participate. All right, moving on. So our next public out education and outreach uh, will be focused around the cleanups that we help host and conduct over the years in our community. Um, two main ones that we focus on are Earth Day, of course, and International Coastal Cleanup in September. A CBA has been a long-standing host of these cleanups, and over the years, we're very thrilled that they have expanded. And in fact, we now have regional partners that we have a ton of different groups heading out there cleaning up alongside us. Um, something new that we've introduced to this type of cleanup is integrating technology and our cell phones into that everyday cleanup, hoping to get young and aged and everyone up the, up the chain um, engaged in, in a new way of tracking what trash that we're finding out there. So we've actually partner or help host a clean swell app where we have our phones we take them out there and we log and track all of the trash that we're finding um, and this is actually quite useful because we found that we can now track exactly what our highest uh, trash and marine debris items are and believe it or not it's gonna be cigarette butts and food wrappers and bottle caps uh, so that's something we can now do something about in fact we're very excited to be soon launching um, more of a campaign addressing the cigarette butts here and a way Way to bring uh, cigarette butt recycling into our community uh, and that will be taking place out along the pier so stay tuned for more information on that uh, one other unique opportunity we've introduced to our watershed is, again, another um, interactive app and website where we can actually track local biodiversity. So all the different kinds of flora and fauna that we have here, uh, simply by taking a picture and uploading it to a website. It's really neat, it's very user friendly, and it actually helps the individual identify what animal or plant they found, as well as contribute to a humongous database that we can now look at and we can actually see uh, how many observations are logged, how many species that we have here, and honestly, it's astonishing. Another great way to get students involved, to get parents teaching kids about what we have right here in our own backyard. All right, we also partner with, of course, many local um, 
organizations such as uh, Destin Forward, our Rotary Clubs, our Garden Clubs, Fishing Clubs. We always participate in the Henderson Beach Bash, Harbor Events, and with Scout Groups. So these are just some examples of the different um, kinds of outreach that we do. We might be able to take a touch tank, we'll catch up some critters, and take it out there to Henderson Beach and have a show and tell and teach everyone what we have here in our backyards. We speak a lot. I speak all the time to Fishing Clubs, which are actually our best partners. Uh, and they are the ones that are so eager to receive information on our water quality and, of course, uh, all of the fisheries and how everything's doing out there. Um, this past year, we did participate in the Fly Fishing Film Festival. Um, we always are there, um, and of course, it's, we actually benefit from it. It's a benef we are a beneficiary from that event, so we're very grateful for that partnership. And this year, something new we were able to engage in is Half Shells on the Harbor, where all of the oyster shell that was discarded at that event actually came right back to us, to our restoration facility, where it dries out over a period of time. Then we bag it up, and it goes straight back into our bay in order to build more oyster reefs. It's a win-win for all. Yes. <laughs> All right, moving on to public involvement and participation. So this is, um, again, a different category under that MPDES permit. Um, and we are looking at a way to engage local citizens in monitoring our water through something we have called our Volunteer Citizen Science Water Quality Monitoring Program. So currently, we have two volunteers sampling six different water quality stations uh, throughout the city of Destin. They do this every single month. So they take a water sample, and they also get quality water chemistry data. Um, we're really excited to be having some new volunteers on board, one of them coming from the Panhandle Fly Fishers Club. Um, and as a, a younger member of that club is looking for ways to engage everyone in conservation friendly activities, which we think, again, win-win. All right, so take a quick look at that screen behind you. Just to, uh, let me point out those water quality stations that we have here in the city of Destin. Um, so down along the bottom, we'll start off looking at the harbor. We have two stations in the very middle of the harbor. You'll see in dark blue with those yellow arrows pointing to them. And then up at the top, we do have four stations that are scattered along uh, the backside of those bayous that are heading out into the bay. So these are our six water quality stations that we are monitoring for the city of Destin through this volunteer program. All right, we're going to take a quick deep dive into some numbers. Don't get too caught up in the numbers. We'll look at something nice and friendly here in just a second. But we do have to know, how do we look at water quality? What are the standards and what does it mean? And it all does come from this. This is called the Numeric Nutrient Criteria, and it comes from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. They give us the standards and the regulations, and we're out there collecting that information. And now we're at that point of actually measuring up and saying, hey, what does our water look like? Like. And, and what does it mean, more importantly? Um, so we have just, just the brief things on the screen. We have two different sections of the bay we'll be looking at today, of course, because that's where the city of Destin resides. The west side of the bay and the middle side of the bay. And then we have three different things that we're looking at in those particular water bodies. We're looking at two different um, elements, phosphorus and nitrogen, that we call the nutrients in the water. Very important for everything else to survive in the water column as well as chlorophyll, and that's the basic building block of all plant life and algae in the water. Again, very important for everything to survive. Now, what we want to see is those levels not going above the levels on the screen. We do not want excess because that's when we have problems that can start to occur and maybe degradation of the water over time. All right, so up here, uh, we'll look at Middle Bay first. So the Middle Bay is going to be that region. You're, if you look at the bottom of, oh, if you look at the dots that are in the middle, look at those green dots. That's where our stations are. And we're looking at overall um, the middle side of the bay. On the left side of the maps is going to be the Mid Bay Bridge and heading um, west. So. Good news and bad news, uh, but for, let's see, stations Destin 2 and Destin 3. So those are going to be the two. If you look at that bottom left uh, 
map there, you're going to see green stations in the middle, and you're going to see two uh, red stations on the bottom. We're looking at that chlorophyll map on the bottom left. So what that only means is that our chlorophyll levels for, this is actually for 2020 because long story short, our presentation has gotten delayed, and of course data comes after the fact, um, we did fail at, for chlorophyll at those two stations, two and three. Now this is for the year 2020 and 2020 only. So the good news is that when we look at the long-term trend over 10 years, our chlorophyll across the board is decreasing as a whole. So that is, that is great news. Um, so overall, decreasing chlorophyll, a lot of decreasing values in general, nothing to be concerned about. For 2020, we do know that we had two, two red areas out of all the other greens. So what do we want to do? We just want to keep a close eye on those. We'll monitor those over time and potentially just start thinking about why those levels could be different uh, in the year 2020. Of course, we'll continue that looking at that with this next year in our 2021 analysis and continue to report back to you. Um, all right, so we'll move on to our West Bay results. So here we are looking around again, um, and we're going to notice that all of our stations for all of the three categories are green for 2020. So that is great news across the board. So for our phosphorus, our nitrogen, and our chlorophyll, they all passed, or they all met those standards that were recommended by Florida DEP. So that's great news. All right, moving on to pollution prevention and good housekeeping, another one of those MPDES requirements. Um, something that we do here at CBA to fulfill this is what we call monofilament fishing line recycling. Uh, we actually have five different recycling bins throughout the city of Destin, four along the harbor, and one in Joe's Bayou, where any fisherman is able to discard of their used or unused fishing line into those bins. We pick it up, it actually goes to be recycled at Berkeley Fishing Institute, and it's turned back into fishing gear, tackle boxes, or benches, something useful in the end. Again, another win-win. Uh, so this past um, reporting period, April to September 2021, we did recycle 3.3 could be yards of fishing line in that program. And overall, we've, we've really been increasing our recycling on fishing line across the board. So we see that as a, as a great way for not only fishermen, but the community to engage in another sustainable and friendly behavior. Um, we threw across our five stations. We do have one volunteer with the city of Destin that helps us regulate those bins. It was very helpful. Um, and moving forward, we're always looking for more community partners to help us extend the reach of this program. We've actually been looking at bait shops and charters and different kind of stakeholder groups that might be interested in turning in that fishing line for recycling. And we've, had, we've actually had some really good partnerships for them, like with Emerald Coast Bait and Tackle, who have been a great partner and are now recycling a, a lot of line every single month. <laughs> All right, last but not least for pollution prevention, uh, we do have our oyster shell recycling program. Um, so this is, again, where we um, are actually in partnership with four different Dustin restaurants. We pick up their discarded oyster shell. Uh, we take it back to our CBA headquarters in Santa Rosa Beach where it dries out over six months, and then we're able to reuse it to build uh, oyster reefs back into our bay. Um, so this is just a very neat program. Um, it's been around for quite some time. We continue to expand uh, the restaurants that are in the program. Um, and of course, the more oyster shell we get, then the more restoration that we can do. So it's, it's a, again, a win-win program here. Um, a neat part of the program is that we've, we've been able to create some educational placemats to give out to the restaurants that teach kids and adults and their families about the program and about why oysters are important to begin with in our water and what oyster, uh, oyster reefs do for our water quality and for our habitat here in the bay in the Choctahatchee Basin. Uh, this past uh, season, we collected 62.5 tons of oyster shell, um, just in those, and that's just in those four Destin restaurants. So we do have almost 10 plus restaurants in the program across the board. So it's quite a bit of oyster shell. And we're really excited to have a new shell staging site located in Okaloosa County. It's over in Fort Walton Beach. Um, and we're really excited about this because this is now our new host for restoration projects that are based in Okaloosa County. So we can go right over, pick them up, take them and put them right back into the bay right here locally. So it's a, it's a great improvement and it's a lot less far than all the way out in Santa Rosa Beach. 
All right, opportunities. Uh, so with CBA and the city of Destin, we are just uh, very excited and thankful to be in this continued partnership with the city here. It's very helpful to us. Um, something to look forward to in the future would be our interactive water quality map. This is a long-term goal of our organization where we'd actually be putting those results that I was just speaking to you about um, into an interactive map where the community would be able to go and click on the station that's nearest their house or perhaps nearest their favorite fishing spot and be able to get real-time information on the salinity of the water, the temperature, what those things are that we were just looking at. What are nutrients and chlorophyll and where are the levels? Are they good or not? Are they bad? So we see that as a great um, interface for the community and for the city as well to use as a resource. So that we are hoping to premiere that this fall. Um, so we'll definitely be reaching out to the city. Um, of course, in hopes of launching that and putting some, some good hype behind it. Uh, next, we would love to just leverage the positive impact from the existing programs. We think that our partnership here has done a lot of legwork, a lot, and it's made a lot of progress over the years. So we would just love to see the city and CBA working together to share that information with the community, to provide those volunteer opportunities as they come up, whether it be our water quality monitors, or maybe some more people are interested in recycling fishing line, or maybe restaurants are, are maybe eager to get on board of our program. Um, and then lastly, we would just love to increase participation in all of the programs, of course. So if anyone is interested, please feel free to let us know and continue to help us share that information. We certainly appreciate it. We got a couple of folks who want to ask you a question or two. Absolutely. Ms. Abair, you want to go first? Well, I was going to recommend that the city council authorize city manager to sign the fiscal year 22 agreement between the Chockahatchee Basin, Basin Alliance of Northwest Florida State College and the city of Destin. And I also want to commend you on your enthusiastic presentation. It's just so, I mean, you can't help but want to be involved because you are very enthusiastic about it. And I'm just really glad that we partnered with y'all. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate what all of you do. And we, we're thankful for this opportunity. Mr. Bagby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You did a great job. Thank you. you know, you and Allison do a great job. Hey, yeah. Uh, I heard elementary school and I heard middle school and I heard you need volunteers and I heard if you guys would just turn around right. to, that, to that row right behind you, those people, Allison, that's the friend, the yeah, they, they really want to help you. And we would love to see y'all help each other. And we would the love that too. City, we would so. love that too. We're definitely, we're, we're in cahoots. It is, it will happen. No doubt. We do have some high school programming as well um, that has been ongoing. We work with Fort Walton Beach High School currently, but we're actually revamping our program. So this is a, it is a great opportunity and we're, we're working to grow seagrass in schools uh, in high school programs. So we think that that will be a great fit, hopefully, uh, for Destin High School. Mm -hmm. Mr. Braden. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the, the oyster shell beds. Um, what happens to that when you put the oyster shells back? Do they somehow start new oysters? Yes, that's a great question. So, yes, sir. So, basically, we're putting in oyster material that so which oysters can grow on. So, we do that by oyster shells themselves and then other materials um, with calcium carbonate in them, so maybe limestone rock or something similar. So when we offer that into our bay, oyster spat will come and settle on them and then grow and create more oysters and more oyster reefs over time. So we actually are limited in that substrate in our bay currently, so that's why we're, again, kind of starting the formation, building the foundation for more oyster reefs to grow. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and how does the water quality in the east part of the bay stand up to the west part? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I would have to go back and look at the actual maps to be very specific, like as the, in the ones that we are looking at here. But across the board, really our water quality is in good shape. Um, but we are definitely just kind of pinpointing all those little red dots on there and just taking a step back, looking at them um, and making sure that we look at what year it is, what's going on, and then looking at that long-term trend and making sure we're not seeing any sharp increases or decreases in something that would be maybe not 
we would like to see. But as a, a total as a whole, I would say it's actually doing quite well. Um, the, east, the eastern side of the bay, there's nothing extremely significant, no significant trends that are taking place, very similar to the west side. Awesome. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Sure. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for coming. Sure. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I've done the grasses in classes, not as a young kid, but it's <laughs> something else, so I, I enjoy it. What causes high chlorophyll? Oh, that's a great question. So nutrients and chlorophyll can come in excess from a variety of, of causes. A lot of them will actually have to do with stormwater runoff, which is really why this program is so great. So when we have a lot of stormwater being an excess water that is going to be draining onto the bay, it carries different things with it, such as yard clippings, excess um, debris, leaves, things like that. So those are potentially ways that your chlorophyll could be increasing over time, just with different things that are running into the water. So the one that failed was Destin 3, you said? Two and three. Two and three, mm -hmm. which is Indian Bayou and some other neighborhoods that possibly have run off. Into that bayou? Correct, yes. Yes. And the good news is, is that over the long term trend, we have not seen any changes in 10 years. So it could have been an outlier. Um, yeah, sure. definitely. But yes, absolutely good to think about why yeah, would that right. be happening there. Mm -hmm. So then the ones in the harbor are listed as Fort Walton Beach 9 and 10. They are, correct. So That's the term. Do you have anything for those today? Like on these pass and fill? Yeah, that's a great question. Those, um, there's not a actual DEP standard for the harbor in and of itself. So there is no like pass fail coding that we have to go by through the government. Um, so we've been monitoring those over time, um, and there's no statistically significant trends there at this point in time either. Mm -hmm. So those are those are monitored monthly as well. Those two yes, points. they are monitored monthly. Mm -hmm. There's no DP standard. Correct. But you still monitor it for what safety reasons, concerns with the environment? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all all of the above. Uh, so we have a catalog. Uh, we want to have a baseline over time. So we've been doing our our. Um, our organization has been around since 1996. A lot of our water quality stations have been taking place for over 10 to 20 years. So we really want to have a nice strong data set of 10 plus years of time so that we can go in and we can actually run an individual um, analysis on a particular station and look for those overall trends over time. So that's why, yes sir, it's important to have individual points over time around our sure. entire water body to and see. And how does y'all's measurements or monitoring versus the Department of Health? Do they do, they do something as well? They do. Area? Yes, they do. That's a great question. Um, Department of Health monitors for bacteria in our waterways, so we do not do that. Um, that is all them, but yes, they sure. will do that during our warmer months. And last one. Okay. Sure. Where, where can we see the monthly stats on the reports? Uh, anyone that would love to access them, I'll be happy to sit down with you and go over Every single station or uh, mean annual geometric means over time, you can ask me and I will get like those to you. They're not listed or anything online right now? Or? No, that is the hope for the future the of the future interactive the map. Got Currently, it. you just have to ask me and I'll, and I'll walk you, you through it. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure, sure. It. Any other questions? <clears throat> yeah, 2020, I think, was uh, probably one of the largest rain events in exactly. 100 years. Um, yes, that sir. That was when Pensacola got 27 inches yeah. in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, that had a lot to do with, especially Absolutely. in the Bayou, because it takes a while for that one to run out. <clears throat> Mr. Wagner. All right. Uh, it's awesome seeing you on this side, <laughs> seeing you in action. I just wanted to echo everything. I got a lot of the answers I was looking for. Um, the only one I had is uh, for the, the planting of the grasses. Um, that's for, what does that help with as far as planting grasses on the shoreline? That's a great question. Um, so shoreline grasses help with a variety of things. So first off, they help with reducing erosion, erosion control, right? So that's a big problem that we have here, individual properties with erosion happening rapidly. So by planting plants, those roots of the plants anchor the sediment there and just really stabilize um, everything. Two, they actually reduce
reduce um, pollution. So the plants are amazing. They're able to actually pull toxins out of the water and keep them um, and, and remove toxins from our water. Uh, three, they also provide a great habitat for all the, the young fish and crabs, things like that. So they provide basically a, a very nursery-like habitat for everything that goes up the food chain as well as birds and things like that. Awesome. And then that's a follow up and this might be out of the wheelhouse. Uh, does the fence or um, the walls that we would put in as sea walls, do they have any benefits? Sea walls? Yes. Or li just sea just walls. walls? Plain yeah. sea walls. Versus That's a great question. So we get a lot of questions on sea walls, and we always recommend to see if a property might be eligible for what we call a living shoreline. And that is actually where we plant plants and we put in some kind of uh, oyster reef breakwater to slow down the wave action, uh, reduce your erosion. Um, so that's a very natural, easier, uh, maybe more environmentally friendly solution. Sea walls, on the other hand, are, are quite, they're hard. So unfortunately, what we see a lot, they might protect one property from erosion, right? Mm -hmm. But they actually end up affecting the properties on either side or perhaps even across across the waterway from them. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So adding more seawalls to the problem would just extend the problem of yes. hyper-erosion farther down the line. Yes, typically that is how it works. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you see most uh, bayside properties use riprap now to oh, combat correct. that. I think, uh, and we're seeing it on I think sea point. walls are a th kind of a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. People use walls now upland, but then they rip wrap their shoreline because yeah. they don't want erosion either because it takes away their. I don't want to assume on the Noriego Point side of things where we're seeing that erosion. No, that's a different animal. Mr. Braden, I see you up. Yeah, um, is there a reason y'all don't do any uh, water quality in Marlar Bayou? I'm sorry, which bayou? In Marlar Bayou. Um, no particular reason. We just have had our location set at specific points for quite some time. So we are, if we're open to interpretation. Um, if we would see a trend, maybe that would suggest we would need to take another point in a particular bayou, then we're definitely open to looking at that. But they, we've just had these longstanding um, particular points over, like I said, about 10 years. So just keep to keep it consistent. But no, there's no reason why we don't have one there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. Great presentation. Thank you. All righty then. We will step up. Item 3B. Well, Lance, this is your show. I mean, so take it away. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, item B is the FY 2021 annual audit and financial statement. Um, with us today, we have Mr. Thomas Smith, CPA and director, who will present the independent auditor's report on behalf of EFPR Group LLP for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2021. Mr. Smith, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Take it away, sir. All right, thank you for the introduction, Lance. Um, hello, everybody. We are at the end of the audit. We are ready to issue financial statements after the City Council approves the drafts tonight. Uh, the financial statements have gotten quite lengthy. They're over 100 pages. So what we did is we provided a one-page board summary, which I'm going to go over. And after that, i uh, be more than happy to answer any questions on the audit or the financial statements. So at this point, we are ready to issue clean, unmodified opinions on the financial statements. Uh, we also issue a statement on the Community Redevelopment Agency, as well as a statement on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill schedule of ca cash receipts and expenditures. Uh, as part of our financial statements, we do assess the internal controls of management and the city, and we are required to issue a report on that as well. And we are pleased to announce that we did not come across any significant deficiencies or weaknesses that the council needs to be aware of. Uh, management was very helpful throughout the audit. They provided us everything we needed. And we're happy to announce that we didn't have any audit adjustments during the audit. And that, that's important to note because that means that the city council is receiving accurate financial information throughout the year. If we were reporting audit adjustments at year end, that might indicate that the report to get throughout the year might not be accurate, but we are happy to announce that all the financial, the financial statements were accurate that we received. Uh, just from a numerical standpoint, we have to issue what's called the citywide financial statements. And at the citywide level, your revenue extended, exceeded your expenditures by 10.9 million. And there's really two drivers to that. The uh, big one is that the revenue increased by $3.6 million over the prior year. 
And that's really because you have a $4.1 million revenue from Okaloosa County for the land, land beach uh, donation. Uh, your expenses also did increase by $200,000, which is only a 1% increase from the prior year, which really indicates strong budget controls by the city. So at the end of the year, being September 30th, 2021, you had a net position of $131.2 million, which really indicates that the city is in a strong financial position. Now, that, that is a citywide financial statement, but really I like to focus in on the fund level, uh, especially the government, the general fund. That's really where you set the budget at the beginning of the year, and that's really how the city operates. And there was a decrease in the general fund of $5.2 million, as you can see in the chart in the board summary. Uh, that was budgeted, though. There was a budget of $4.8 million decrease, and really the main driver of that is that the city established three new funds this year, uh, the building code, the technology fund, and the Oklahoma half penny fund. So that decrease really indicates a transfer of that fund balance to establish those new funds. So the, really the important thing is that the city's actual results mirrored the budget expected results. And that, that shows that the budget that you set at the beginning of the year ended up showing very accurate to the actual results. So at this point, I want to turn over to the city council. If there's any questions on the financial statements or the audit, I can answer. All right. Uh, first up is Mr. Bagby. Well, I'll make the motion before I ask my questions, Mr. Mayor. I move to accept the 2021 annual audit and financial statements. Second. Okay, I got a motion. I have a second. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Bagby, and then Mr. You, Destin, you'll be next. Mr. Smith, uh, how many municipalities or public entities do y'all do in the state of Florida? Do you know? Uh, we do two cities in the state of Florida. Okay. I was kind of hoping it would be more because I noticed on page uh, Roman numeral 12 of your cover sheet talks about, as soon as I pull it up, it'll talk about it, capital improvements. And in our annual budget, the capital item is over five years and over 25,000. And I was wondering in your experience, is that uh, in line with other cities or is that smaller or less or what? It's on page, yeah, XII. Mm -hmm. uh, typically those projects are a little bit smaller. Um, I mean, it really depends on what you feel is accurate for the city specifically. Uh, usually, a, a capital project would have to be something that will last for more than one year, and it depends on the capitalization threshold of the city. And a city the size of Destin typically would be a little bit closer to 10000 Okay. And uh, my next question is on uh, our policies. Did you have a chance to review our investment policy, our procurement policy? Obviously, you reviewed our uh, personnel policy because you did the thrift the employee thrift fund but did you review any of our other financial related policies we do look at the investment policy to make sure that it is in line with the state of florida laws and regulations uh, we do have to also issue an examination report saying that the city is in line with those policies uh, we do look at the procurement policy not in order to issue a report in the same manner as the investment but in order to issue the report that there was no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in accordance with the internal controls of the city. So, so we my, do look at the procurement policy in order to make sure that the internal controls are being followed. Okay. Did you, were you able to assess, uh, this is a similar type of question because obviously we're redoing our investment policy and we're in the process of redoing our procurement policy. Uh, are we higher, lower? about average from the other municipalities that you have experienced uh, with our levels of spending by say city manager or staff uh, and the other parts of our procurement policy? Uh, your, your procurement policy is very much in line with municipalities your size that we do deal with. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, Mr. Destin. Thank you, Mayor. I was looking through the audit looking for the management letter and I looked on the pages 97 anywhere I can find some statistic 
typical tables, but no management letter like generally I see. And maybe I've missed it. Mr. Bagby, do you see it somewhere? Uh, and a management I letter. What I thought might have been, but it was actually Yeah, a uh, management letter is kind of like cut to the chase. Yeah. It's usually in, included in audits, and it tell it the auditor gets comments on how things are being done, and you know, sometimes they're long with a lot of recommendations, and sometimes they're short with none. And what you do is you take your management letters on a year-to-year -year basis and see what recommendations were made last year for improvements, and see if you make them. But I don't see a management letter per se in there. Am I missing it? The measure letter is included on pages 97 and 98. I, I looked at those. And, and, and we, we, didn't ha we didn't have any comments for this year. I think you're talking about our management. No, the, the auditor, usually, the auditor usually does one. Okay, well, if it's not there, we'll have to. No, two years ago, we had a management comment uh, regarding our fund balance. Um, because the city, uh, it was thought that the city didn't ha have an established fund balance policy, uh, but I was able to clear that up with our auditors uh, for the 2020 statements, and they had no findings or no management uh, items for us to work on at the end of 2020, and then their results came in the same again for 2021, that they didn't see any uh, need for us to improve upon any policies um, for 2021 either. And how long has this company been doing our audits? I'm sorry. This is their sixth year. And uh, I'll be bringing a, I have a, an audit RFP that I've been working on. Um, it's just a matter of having the right number of hours, but you'll be seeing the audit RFP coming out um, at some point for your approval before we put it out on the street. Okay, well, congratulate you. In the 34 years I'm doing this, I've not seen an audit that had nothing in a management letter. So very good. That reflects very well on Crystal, doesn't it? Let's fix this ass because Crystal's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? Seeing none, we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, let's go vote for this. Thank you for your briefing, sir. Hey, thank you for having me. Vote is unanimous. So moved. Mr. Mayor, may I be heard? Yes. Uh, the previous presentation, I believe, uh, Council Member Aber made a motion, the recommended motion. I didn't realize that that was part of the consent agenda, that in the consent agenda it said the, Chalk had, it, the Alliance contract renewal was part of what we were going to consent, just we were already in agreement of it. I hadn't realized that it had, it had been put in the consent agenda, so I withdraw that motion. Okay. Got it. Go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 4C, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Scott Jenkin, who is the city's project engineer for the Captain Royal Melvin Heritage Park project. Um, also, here in the audience tonight, we have Joe and Bill Garvey, our contractors, along with uh, Mr. Mike Buckingham, our project manager. So I'll turn it over to Scott for a briefing, and then we are requesting some approval of, of one item at the end of this. Good evening. I'm Scott Jenkins with Jenkins Engineering. I appreciate you guys letting me come here tonight to give you an update on the Captain Royal Melvin Park. Um, there has been a lot of activity on this park over the last few weeks, so I'm happy to say that they've made some progress out there. I know it's coming slowly but surely, um, but they are making progress on it, and we are kind of seeing the end of the end of the tunnel here pretty soon on this. Um, I just kind of wanted to go through some of the things that have been accomplished over the last few weeks. Um, they have installed uh, the lift station wet well on site, which is a big item for the site because it's difficult to install there. They have started working on compacting sub-base and base material for the pavers along the harbor side, so that should be getting placed here in the next week or so. They did get the holocore panels placed on the roof of the building now so that we can get it enclosed and waterproofed and really start getting fixtures and things turned over. Um, and they've completed the block work internally and gotten that, that work done. Um, some of the things that you'll start seeing coming up in the next couple of weeks are going to be waterproofing of the roof panels, placement of the top slab on the roof, which is the final surface, um, concrete pouring of the stairs, which I think is scheduled for Friday, assuming the weather doesn't hold them off on this, um, which, is, which is a really big portion of the work out there, which will make a big difference here. Um, 
Also stucco placement on the buildings and the final signage and final landscaping for the city. Um, the item I think that Lance is talking about is a change order request for a time extension um, on the project. And really this, this goes all the way back to January of last year. It's kind of a catch up on all their time they've requested throughout the course of the project. Um, some of that is because of some delays on notice to proceed. Some of it's just because we didn't get involved until about uh, September of this past year. So we're really trying to catch up on some of the paperwork associated with it. But this change order should catch everything up to date. And the contractors here, if you have any questions for them also, but that puts the substantial completion date actually at this Friday. So there's a lot of work to do, but there's an additional 30 days after that to get to final completion for this project. Um, I do anticipate, to be honest with you, there will be one item hanging out, and that's the handrail construction. There was some decision making at the city that took a little while, but we do know the direction I think we're going now, and we hope to have an answer on that tomorrow. So I do see it moving forward. I know it's going slowly. Um, but it is progressing and hopefully within the next month you guys will see a building that's substantially complete other than just a few finished touches that the city has to do out there. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys have or as Lance said, the contractors are here to answer questions and Mike's also here. He's very involved in the project and knows pretty much everything that's going on there. Don't go anywhere. I got them stacked up like <laughs> Atlanta Airport. Um, Mr. Bagby. Well, I'll make the motion so we can start discussing this, Mr. Mayor. I move that the city manager execute change order 11 to the GLC construction contract. Second. Okay, I got a, um, and, and the, I, I got a motion and a second, and you still have the mic. Thank you. Uh, Scott, you know me. Yes, Mike, sir. you know me. I don't know the Garveys. I mean, I wore the staff, at the city manager and deputy city manager and the attorneys out today. I don't even understand it. And I, and I get the whole, it was COVID and, you know, we said we were going to have a notice to proceed in January and we didn't have a notice to proceed until June and all that. And after they let me just, you know, yell and scream, they, the bottom line is, is we still have to get this done and we just need to get it done. And it doesn't matter how angry I am or how disappointed I am or whatever, we just need to to get it done and so that's why i make the motion and that's why i'll support the the city manager and you and mike to mm -hmm. let's just finish this and get it behind us go ahead uh, miss abear my question is is in your best guess if we have great weather this weekend and you get to pour that cement what are you looking at as a date that we could be ready to enjoy it you know, I do think that the April 11th date is reasonable to get to a point where you can do that. There, the one question will be the handrails and how long it takes to get those manufactured and installed, but there may be some temporary things you can do to get the park opened in the meantime. So I think that April 11th date is a reasonable date to, to expect to be able to use the park. And the weather's going to suck. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's we, for we the have, We have had a bit of bad luck. So yeah, yeah, well, it'll probably rain from here on out, but yeah, hopefully not. It's, yeah, uh, hopefully you, not. You can probably go back on the site yeah. Saturday morning and yeah. just wear your coat. Um, Mr. Braden. Thank you. What, what part does the city have to do after the contractor leaves? Um, there's final landscaping that has to be done. There's some signage that has to be done on site. So basically it's a lot of the finished grading and finished touches for, for finishing the site itself. And this extension is till March? April 11th. April 11th? Yes. And you think they can accomplish that? You know, that's, that's probably a better question for the contractor, but I do think they can accomplish everything, like I said, other than possibly the handrail portion of the work. Okay. Well, I don't see it happening. Not the rate this project's been going, but wish them the luck. Maybe you'll get an Easter Bunny surprise. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Um, thank you. Yes. April 11th, contractor's done. That's not city's done with their portion. Would that be? They or? should be able to do the work simultaneously okay. on a lot of that. You. So I would hope the city okay. would be able to get in and, and okay. come, come uh, You mentioned we didn't come around until September. Are you referring oh, I'm to? I'm sorry. Yes, my company. Yeah, we, we really didn't get involved in the construction aspect of it until okay. September. And uh, what 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 is your role on the project? Uh, I'm the civil engineer for the project. Lance came to us, and we're the consultant, so we're working with the architects, structure guys, and that. But I, I'm 
I'm, I'm just the civil engineer for it. Don't so. throw no rocks at him. He's trying. Okay. <laughs> just asking the questions. Don't throw rocks he's at him. He's working at what he's been given. <laughs> just asking the questions. <laughs> so you said that the 41K is a, a time catch up. So for it's, it's not really about uh, a product. It's not about pieces. It's really just kind of catch up. It, it time is the, the money delays. associated with it is for general conditions and overhead basically okay. so it's additional time associated with um, insurance bond costs sure. fencing okay. securing the site those types so of i heard about the handrails about a month ago but we still haven't made a decision on those i think we have made a decision on what they're what we're going to go with now they're just now getting the information for the change order to get that process so we have to review it and we have a meeting tomorrow that i hope to is that normal to take a month to know about the problem, but then a month later we're still trying to decide uh, what we're going to use? We would hope that it would be quicker than that, yes. It should be quicker than so that. So where's, where's the delay coming from? Us, uh, them? I think it's a, a probably a, a joint thing between trying to make a decision on exactly what you want, plus once you make that decision, getting the information provided so that you can see what the cost is. To pick the handrail? To pick the handrail, yes. Is it like a magazine you look through and you pick out the handrails or I'm just, I don't, I don't, I don't really understand how we're delayed so. four yeah. plus weeks of picking handrails. Yeah. We still I, haven't decided. Yeah. Water so I, I don't, yeah. No, it's not water on the bridge because I'm trying to understand why it takes so long to make a decision, but um, we still have made the decision. So in your opinion, out of $110,000 remaining on the budget, should we have more change orders coming? There will, be, there will be one associated with the handrail. The handrail change. Yes, sir. Other, other than that, I don't believe so. Do we have any idea approximately the costs for the change on that yet? There's a, there is a change order in place right now that is $40,000 additional. Not this 40? No, sir. For the, for the handrail cost. For the handrails. Okay. Um, and then I heard a while ago about uh, a beam issue. We're past that? I believe we are, yes. What do you mean you believe we are as our I, I don't know that there ever was a beam issue to be honest with you the contractor okay. has asserted there's a beam issue there's been no report there's been no so no information given to us to support that so the structural engineer for the project says there's not a beam issue okay. um, they are doing some additional things to add some extra thickness to prevent any kind of corrosion on this on the structural steel inside the beam but um, sure I believe we are past that okay yes. uh, that's it for now. I have some questions for the contractor after this. And it's all right. Mr. Dessen. Thank you, Mayor. I, I want to congratulate the uh, contractors on the last 10 days. They've been, they've been out there working. I was there every morning, of course, because I'm a neighbor, and I would walk out at 1030 and look. And I'm going to tell you there was nothing happening for a very long time. But they're on the right track now, and, and things are moving. And I sincerely hope they'll be able to, to make the April 11th. All righty then. Um, your inquisition is over. Uh, I have a council member here that wants to uh, ask a few questions, our contractor, if you would uh, come on up. And Mike, did you have anything you wanted to add after, after he's up? Okay. For the public record. Joe Garvey, 50 Marlboro Road, Shalimar. Thank you, sir. I guess my first question is, how do you feel about the April 11th timeline as the contractor? On the, uh, just to be honest with you, on the um, handrail issue, it takes us out to April 26th is what we have on that sure. handrail issue. Just uh, to explain about the handrails, um, it's okay. The, ori the original date that we asked for approval on them was April 16th of 2021. And we sit here today and there still is no decision. And that's 325 sure. days. Sure. But just be and this has without been the very handrails, though. common throughout the entire project. Sure. I'll give, let, let, let me give one example. And this, this jumped out at me the other day. The lift station that we just put in. We asked for approval on that March 16th, 2021. We got approval on that October 10th, 2021. That was 219 days. 
the fabrication of that lift station was supposed to be on 6 8 2021 it happened on 1 13 2021 and it was 219 days that's how good our schedule was so i don't want to interrupt you and thank you for the I know there's been issues. Yeah. We're aware of that. Yeah. But I'm just kind of wanting to know that the city just told us they're, they're wanting this done. It's going to be done by April 11th, hopefully. Right. I'm just kind of curious with what your the thoughts are for today. Which without gonna, the handrails. Without the without handrails. The hand is it temporarily we might be able to open it without handrails or something. But without yeah. handrails, what's the project? I, I, you like? Let me be honest with you. You really can't open it because you can't get your CEO sure. without handrails. Okay. Well, all right. So will the project be 99.9% .9 done? Yes. Possibly without handrails? Yeah. Okay. So you feel good. If we can just keep on rolling. What's the uh, next three days going to do to you? Four Not days. good. Not yeah. good. Because yeah. it's okay. 80, 90, 67, and 90 percent chance. Sure. Yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So we just got to take that into account, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate it. That's no, all I have. No boring of concrete during those days. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to give Mike his chance. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. You can work on Yeah. Mike Buckingham, 510 Calhoun. Thank you. Let's call a spade a spade. No, no, I'm going to be polite. If you got some information, I'm okay. Gonna, I'm going to bring information. Okay, because okay. I don't want to get in a piss of contest I'm not, here. You in got my word meeting, on it. Okay? But, I, I, but a spade a spade, I'm just, I'm just going to be honest. Okay. The timing is taking so long. Well, Project. that's a, that's spilled. Well, I want to answer I, his I, question. I, I think Mr. I didn't have that question, but I appreciate okay, it. I I'll was just answer. asking about April. Yeah. Mr. Right. Bagby April. pretty much said it. We let's get her done. Right. So if you got anything to add to that, right. you don't have to defend yourself. I'm, I, I'm not at, I'm not any here comments. To defend, I'm not here to else defend myself. All right, I just want my, to keep my job. Nice. My job, Mayor, was to make sure you all get what you're paid for. That's okay. what my job is. Are we? No, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Lance. We got a motion. We got a motion. Yes. Any other comments? Let's let's vote. Yeah, go ahead. Do we? See Johnny. Do we took his turn? Eyes have it. So moved. Lance. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council, and thank you, Garvey Brothers, for coming in tonight. Scott and Mike for coming in tonight. Appreciate that very much. We can see we can see the finish line, so let's keep keep heading that way. Thank you. Um, next up, we have the Destin Crosstown Connector Retention Areas that uh, Council had requested some information on, along with some. It says traffic safety, but I believe the term was uh, a traffic calming was what we were looking for information. And we have um, representatives from At Atkins here to. Uh, do a brief presentation and answer some questions. Is that right? Yes. All right, here we go. Good sign you came back. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. <laughs> well, let's let's hope this one goes better. <laughs> yes. The drawings were excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we um. Well, we'll get into it. So, um, real quick. We'll, we'll touch on the architectural renderings, um, some of the options we have to make Pond 2 a little more accessible for green space, and then um, we'll discuss some of the options for traffic calming. So in the last few weeks uh, since, since we left, um, you know, under guidance from Council, we went ahead and developed the 3D corridor model of the Destin Crosstown connector um, in the sense that we took our 3D surface that we've created in design and brought that into design software to get the architectural visualizations of that. Um, through that, we've also identified and um, you know, can have visualizations of additional areas for green space um, you know, and have a better opportunity to talk about those. So I'll just scroll through. I think you guys have copies of these in your packets, uh, but just for the record, I'll spend a few seconds on each of these. and. Um, we can definitely circle back and answer any questions. So these two have been looking east. So we see pond two on the right-hand side of our screen. 
I don't mean to cut you off. Yep. We've got a, and I don't mean to, if this comes across smart aleck, yeah, I apologize, but the, the building renderings are, I mean, like the, the, obviously the scale is way off. Yes. But this is like a pretty good representation of what the ponds will look like. Exactly. And the time was spent on yeah, not the, the ponds, buildings. the surface. Right. We did not want, to, very purposely, we did not want to misrepresent a specific house. So these are all just yeah, yeah. placeholders. Thank you. <laughs> So this shows the wider section that would, you know, entertain more recreation. This is positioned from the east looking back to the west. So as I mentioned, there's a few other areas that offer green space within the corridor right now. Uh, the first one number one on your screen and on the picture is on the northwest corner and that is just under an acre in size uh, this graphic was from an older presentation um, so the sidewalks are not accurate to what's in there today uh, but you can see what could potentially be done with sidewalk park space in that northwest corner additionally on the two quadrants northwest and southeast quadrants of the roundabout uh, those each have about a quarter of an acre of green space as well. So, um, you know, another option for landscaping, benches, um, anything like that. Again, we're looking at that northwest corner. Again, that's just under an acre in size for that triangle portion. And this is just a overall picture of the corridor as a whole. As I mentioned in those three other green spaces, uh, you have opportunities for art walk, murals, sculptures, uh, benches, exercise equipment, um, things like that. This is a very similar project. Um, again, just under an acre in size. We did this for the Inslee Gateway in Pensacola. So it gives you, puts that one acre footprint into scale. Okay. Um, looking at Pond 2 and some different alternatives, modifications that we could do um, to improve green space or provide additional footprint uh, for green space. Um, the first Opportunity is there is some wiggle room in the capacity right now. So the east side could potentially be raised about one or two feet. Um, and I'll go ahead and make the correction to myself. Last time I was here, I said we were designing to a 100 year storm event. I was incorrect. Um, the actual design criteria is 25 year, 96 hour storm event. Hopefully I got some questions off the list there. <laughs> Uh, we do have our, uh, one of our drainage engineers here as well, so, you know, happy to answer any questions. Some other alternatives, um, you know, to mitigate the slopes and usable space on the ponds, we could do stepped retaining walls that would give you kind of what you see in this picture here. You're still getting the slope on the pond, but you're adding some flat usable green space uh, recreation area. Additionally, um, for the west side of the pond, again, that one's limited by the topography of the road and the existing ground. Um, and just for the pond to operate efficiently, uh, there are certain elevations for the berm elevation and uh, the pond bottom. So just by the natural topography, that one's limited in, in the depth. One of the questions that came up last time we were here is about adding uh, retaining walls for that west um, higher portion to gain additional green space. And what we're looking at here is in order to get, you know, a more consistent pond bottom, you know, have that flat recreation space. Uh, currently, the pond is a variable depth. So this would 
and give it flat pond bottom, similar to the east side, and get rid of the slopes by introducing uh, the retaining walls. And we have a few different options here, whether it's on the right-hand side, and then two different options for that left-hand side as well. All right, and last, last item, we were asked to look at some of the traffic calming opportunities. Um, we looked at the Florida Design Manual chapter on um, the traffic calming, um, traffic management options. And in that chapter, it lists a number of opportunities. And what I have shown here is all of the, all of the opportunities that we are already taking advantage of. Yes, exactly. Well, and actually this, um, in previous version of the presentation, there is an extensive list, and I'd say five to seven of them are not viable for this context classification or situation. Um, of what's left is what you see here, and you know the green check marks are what we are already proposing in the design. So the two additional options would be your feedback control signs and your vertical deflections, which in this case would be a raised crosswalk at the entrance to the roundabouts. Um, a few notes on those. The vertical deflection raised crosswalks, obviously those are meant to manage the approach speed into the roundabouts. Um, my next slide will talk about the speeds and the calculations going into those. And the speed feedback signs, those are good for raising awareness, but there's no physical deterrent for speeding. Um, the physical deterrents, all of those recommended alternatives and you know, best practices and design, those are already being shown in, in the current plans. For the approach speeds into the roundabout, uh, one of the metrics used is the fastest pass fastest path analysis. The design speed and recommended uh, speed through the roundabout is 25 miles an hour. And we can see that we are meeting that recommendation. And the other metric is the some of the turning movements um, do not exceed or do not fall below 15 miles an hour of that operating speed. And the reason, reason being is you don't want cars moving slower through the roundabout, then you have approaching. Uh, you get rear end accidents that way. All right, so I'm happy to entertain any questions. All right, um, Mr. Destin, I got you up while we have him up here. Appreciate it. The retention pond is just taking a, a guess at how much what percentage it takes up of what would have been a nice linear park looks to me like 40-50%. And so no matter what we do to it, it's still a deep retention pond that you can tumble off in and break your neck probably. My suggestion is, and, and I will put in the form of motion after we discussion is over, is that we explore uh, making it retention pond that has underground piping and and so that it can be a flat area where we can use now, I know that costs money I've done it on two different parking lots in, in Destin but if you do the cost analysis of that compared to trying to purchase that much recreation area it's a pretty good deal and if we don't do that we basically turned what could have been a nice linear park into something that's not really gonna be much of a park except for the, the little point point acres that are one, two, and three. And so, you know, after the discussion is over, I'll make a, a motion directing y'all to look at uh, how we can put the retention underground with piping and, and gravel like, like I've done twice in parking lots. Okay. Mr. Bagby. Well, along those same lines, y'all do a lot of projects. Do you, have you ever done projects with exfiltration tubes? like Mr. Dustin's talking about? 
Yes. Uh, to speak specifically to it, I'll invite our drainage engineer up. Okay. And, um, you know, sure. So we have to reinforce me on this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can speak to that. Okay. Yeah, exfiltration is, is definitely an option to be able to utilize. The problem that we have in this particular location is there's no solid outfall um, that we'd be able to discharge to. So mm -hmm. what we're having to do is full retention. Mm -hmm. And um, for the water, uh, water management district in our area, Northwest Florida, um, they don't typically uh, approve exfiltration for the purpose of attenuation. Treatment's fine, mm -hmm. but you know, the attenuation, so, so the, the likelihood is you're going to end up having to do some kind of a hybrid, you know, exfiltration in accommodation with a, uh, uh, an actual physical pond. Um, you know, the other thing you, uh, that's really important to know about the exfiltration options is they have a, a very short uh, lifespan. Um, you know, Water Management District recommends five to ten years. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's money. <laughs> but it's it's you know it, it it can help now sometimes that may also cause uh, problems with uh, you uh, landscaping and uh, lighting options as well as utility locations that you're trying to incorporate into some of these spaces so um, all that would would have to be considered as part of it um, and and I think you know, uh, as far as the the major concerns you know, j just to be able to narrow down is it the east side of the pond or the west side of the pond, or all of it? Um, you know, because there are things that we can do. You know, uh, you know he mentioned that there were uh, there's volume space that we have that we have a little bit of, of float. Um, you know, he, he mentioned that the the 25 year 96 hour storm is the design storm, it's the Ooh, minimum design right. storm. However, we do also accommodate that 100 year storm. It is accommodated within this general space. However, it's designed for the other. Um, now, you know, because of that, we do have some give, and and one thing we can do is is to pull up that eastern side elevation, which right now is only seven feet deep. Um, you know, we can pull it up, you know, possibly one to two feet, so it's a little more shallow. Or, you know, there may even be a potential to pull in some of that area. That's what, what I call the, the finger area on the west side. Um, and, and use some of that volume and flatten that space out that is actually a, a not a steeper section because it's actually just as flat as the other, but a, a, a deeper um, cut area. So you know, we have some different things that we could look at um, that might be able to accommodate at least some of those needs depending upon how we would have to use that hybrid alternative. And you did much better this time, but that's what I thought y'all were gonna look at mm -hmm. coming back this time. And, um, because I will tell you almost 90% of Rosemary Beach is exfiltration tubing because everybody keeps their water on their lot. And some of those houses are really large and have really large roof spaces. And when we put those in, and they've been there, some of them since 96. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, five, 10 years that you can say that's what your planning thing is. But my experience is, mm -hmm. is that they last. Now you have to have a clean out obviously mm -hmm. because sediment gets in there and you gotta you know you gotta i understand all that stuff but we don't need a dadgum huge bowl you know the cost and you talk about the cost of exfiltration tubes the cost of those retaining walls that's not cheap either mm -hmm. okay so i mean we want to create a park we want you to help us create a park so i think what mr destin's suggesting is Get away from the swells and figure out how to give us at least some of that mm -hmm. pond number two area as a park. And I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but Dad Gummit, it's possible. You know, anything in engineering, anything's possible. <laughs> it's just uh, time and money. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the retaining wall, I saw that, and I appreciate you manning up and saying I misspoke because a lot of people wouldn't do that. They would just you know keep digging with that shovel because that was the first thing I noticed you can ask the staff was hey last time they told us a hundred year now we're 25 year and we still got the same deep V so I'm I'm more than willing and and I agree completely I've I've got two very small ponds that top off into the exfiltration system in my parking lot I've been there 19 years uh, the 
ponds are probably 10% of what they would have been because of the exfiltration, and I have never seen them full through all the hurricanes in the last 19 years. So it's possible, mm -hmm. and that's really what we would like for you all to do, bring us back a way to shrink that pond down into a reasonable size and put the rest of it into the pipes. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Northwest Florida Water Management District approved that, and they approved the one that I have in my other parking lot also, and that was six or seven years ago. Out of curiosity, so, do, you, do you have a discharge point from your facility at all, or is it all, all every, every bit's retained on site? It, okay. It's all there. Okay. Yeah, it, it, there are two ponds with outlets that when they fill up, it goes in, mm -hmm. and we have never, ever had a, even had those ponds mm -hmm. half full. So, you know, yeah, I that's, mean, that's you what know. we're looking for. Let's shrink that pond up to where it's, people can actually use it for the recreational area that we Yeah, we'd be happy to look at it. Okay. Okay, now it's my turn. Um, while I got you, I'm going to ask you a question first before I get into my rant. Um, to do these kind of changes that are being recommended, give me time and, and money. For changing the design? We're at a 60% plan. Yes. Which normally would. you don't change plans at 60%. Yes. So just how much more time to do, to explore this, redesign, and how much more money? to know it's already been spent on the project. I'll start there first. It would need to go in through a 60% redesign submittal, um, but to do that, we're looking at six to eight weeks of design, and that would be about forty to $50,000 of cost. Okay, and that's just for the change of plans. That doesn't affect construction cost or nothing else, just plans which was already factored in what we we'll got here with the 60% plan. Correct, and at this stage, when we make changes to any one piece, there's a, a massive trickle down because our roadway section, the landscaping, they already show, you know, the. the yeah, and you said the aspects. word massive. So that's an adjective. Um, I'm going to speak that this thing's been going on. This is almost the second, almost a third full council that's taken this, fourth, fourth full council that's taking this crosstown connector under advisement. We have a, a, a few new faces on here in the last two years. And on the first Tuesday in November, we're gonna have more. And I'm sure that if we don't get this finalized between now and November, first Tuesday in November, it could uh, result in some further uh, changes. So me and, and the way I've uh, approached my business uh, throughout the years and was beneficial was I live by the KISS system. Let's keep it simple. Stan, <laughs> y'all know what the real word is. And, 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 and so here's part of the problem I have with all these changes and ideas in the talk about a park is because this was not supposed to be a park. This is supposed to be a cross town connector to provide connectivity that is direly needed now without any further delays. Not only that, but the process when you get to a 60% plan is just to pat them on the head and say, let's go get as the FDOT was here so they could get their thing done so we could actually start turning a shovel and start building this project. Now, they've done a really good job of making a very simple change on the very first page that makes that area a recreational opportunity still because it doesn't have retaining walls and all the other options I wish you hadn't put in there. But you did, with all those other options, you did on every single page say, it will take more time and it will cost more money. So I appreciate that. So my recommendations and encouragement to all of y'all, uh, we've got some other things that could take place that provide more recreational opportunities in our community. The plan, the 60% plan right now has recreational opportunities for our crosstown connector. But, but the importance I think that we need to put back on this plan is that it is a connector, a community connector to help ease our traffic problems. And whether it's six weeks delay to get the plan and another $50,000, but then the, the FDOT says, well, you've changed our 60% plan, so now we've got to start. This could run into the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we probably won't get the Crosstown Connector built for another 36 to 48 months. And so I really, really would like to recommend to everyone, and you guys get to do the voting, that we take the simple approach to get us the most amount of green grass without 
major changes to the projects that we can move forward and, and, and keep this thing on track to, to get it done while we still got our acquisition money, while we still got our uh, uh, commitments from the, uh, the, the uh, uh, county commissioners and not delay this project anymore. So the board is lit up. I've said my piece. I don't get the vote, but I think we're doing our community a disservice if we do this and not accept the 60% plan with that minor change to give us the, the, the shallowest swell possible. And first up is Mr. King. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> yeah, I would, I'd like to say I just, I'm in support of what you're, what you're saying, Mayor. Um, I think the changes like this, are, and with all due respect, Mr. Destin, Mr. Bagby, I think that changes like this are what's kept it just bumping down the road and it's taking so long to do. I mean, we are at a place where we have the capability of getting this done. I really like the idea of having a pond there with water. That's not gonna happen. This looks like a wonderful solution to that problem. I don't, I don't think that, I think if safety was an issue, um, I don't think it's a deep enough, a deep enough pond to be a safety concern. Um, if it looks anything like this, I think it's, it's gonna be a wonderful thing. I'm, I'm in support of uh, moving forward with it. Mr. Destin. Um, we can wait if you want to wait, let the other council members. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just might as well go, uh, Mayor and I. And I always uh, enjoy your rants, they're entertaining, if nothing else. The uh, but but most of the points you made don't really make sense to me. We're still two years away from construction, that's if we're successful in acquiring the properties at the other end. We most likely will have to condemn those. That is a long and drawn out process. Um, the the amount of time it would take them to redesign is within that envelope of two years before we ever get to any construction of any sort. It won't delay uh, anything at all that I can see of. And the bottom line is why throw an opportunity away to provide more recreational area to the, uh, to the public? Because we're in a hurry to complete a project that's been going on 10 years that we really won't affect the time of it all. Uh, and in the depth of the, even the revised pond is still seven feet in places, isn't it? Uh, that's not a safe environment for anybody who falls off into that unless we do an extensive uh, amount of construction to try to make it safe. To look at this and, and not let this call with an opportunity to provide, it looks like several acres more of recreation for the people in Destin and to not realistically delay this project at all because we are still so far down the line on actual breaking ground it is illogical to me, but everybody has their opinion. Um, Lance, would you like to address that on the timeline working with FDOT if we're going to make this substantial change? Is I will, but first, you mind if I ask a question? because I, I need clarif clarification myself. Um, well, well, what is being asked of this pond area, which we want to be a recreation area? Our, let me back up. Our council, in my opinion, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, but voted um, to let staff proceed with acquisitions. So this is not interfering with that part of the process, which has, has to take place. I mean. Is, is that that's correct right okay so are they linked or can one go without the other so what we would be able to do is look at the finger portion of pond two and we can look at adding exfiltration pipe reducing that footprint of the pond um, you know, as uh, Miranda mentioned, we'd still need that larger portion, the east side of Pond 2, uh, for the outfall. Um, but I do not believe that affects the acquisition or the, the roadway footprint, the right of way needed for the roadway at all. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as the acquisition goes, which is what we're in the middle of right now, I mean, we have money budgeted for this year through the state. And again, in the next state fiscal year, which begins July 1, so that's... Um, 
that puts us out a year and a half easy where we would be acquiring the property. So it's hard for me to say that we're, we could get behind, but we might not too. Because we've got to acquire the property in order, in order to build it. All right, you gave your best answer. Uh, Ms. Hebert. Well, that was my question, Mayor, thank you. Um, because we don't have the rest of the properties, we can't even start this. Even if we said, good with, we're good, don't worry about the ponds, start. Get past the 60%. You're still waiting until we have acquired these properties, which could be 18 months. So if we supposedly went with the, what Mr. Destin's discussing, another 18 months of reworking things, we would still be within a window of getting them acquired and you being able to come back with what is being proposed. Is that right? They're different tracks. So yeah, the, the assuming the right of way requirements don't change, the acquisition you know, is going on its process. The design within that footprint could change and it wouldn't have an effect on one or the other. I'm just, at this point, I just feel like we're trying to take on, and I totally respect where you're coming from, Mr. Destin, that we want to give our residents as much recreational space, but we're also trying to move to acquire something else to be a recreational city center. Um, and we're trying to do some more green spaces behind some of the other properties that are currently being built with the recreation department. So, you know, I'm not really positive. You said it was seven foot that you could bring it up. So it wouldn't be a danger if it wasn't as steep. Is that correct? Yes, it could be raised east side to about five or six feet in depth instead of the seven feet. What you're asking is that they continue with it at seven feet and make it I'm asking them to, to level it. To do with the and the and the And but is it unreasonable to ask you what that'll cost? Not just the redesign and and the delays, but you said that it trickles down because when we when this project was financed to build this road, we were given a, 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 an estimated cost, were we not, Lance, to build a crosstown connector? Both ends, building it and all that? If we're, if we're gonna change the, the, the construction of this property, does anybody have, you know, it sounds, I mean, it's a good idea. I'm not disputing the good idea, but when you start getting into time delays, which you've effectively argued against, but cost is is another factor yeah and that would require getting into some of the initial designs to see the extent of the exfiltration and you know how much of the pond you can save so that's a that's a sliding scale and we, we and a lot of people that. don't do the exfiltration because it's way more expensive correct so just get ready that's no not a true statement. that's not it's cheaper I didn't see any, I didn't see a retaining wall in the first picture. There was no retaining wall, correct? The retaining walls were shown as options to increase the footprint. Um, they are not a preferred alternative. Mine neither. Um, Mr. Bagby, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I I find this discussion interesting since I was here at the very beginning of this and I thought it would have been finished five years ago <laughs> and it's not even put a shovel in the dirt yet. So I think we all want what we think is best for this city. I honestly believe that everybody up here wants that and I, I tend to agree with as much green space. I don't, you know, make the whole city center green space. Make the whole city green space. I'm fine, you know, I authored the tree, tree ordinance, so I'm not, you know, I love trees. Not palm trees, but I love trees. The, uh, crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles. No, nope, not crepe myrtles <laughs> either. Okay, but, you know, let's look at, you know, the old saying, good, fast, or cheap, pick two. Okay, well, fast left about six years ago. Okay, so good 
ought to be our focus. It's, it's not going to be cheap. It doesn't matter which option we pick. You know, yeah, even if it's 100000 which it won't be 100000 I don't believe, but even if it is, it's something that we can be proud of. You know, when you're out there and you're putting the shovel in the ground and when they put the little plaque and they say, you know, Lance Johnson, city manager, and all the city council members and the mayor, you know, and you drive down that road and you see that park, it's something you can be proud of. There are, part, there are things that we've done in the last 15 years that I go, I remember when we approved that, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud that we, we did that, and I hope, you know, the parks that y'all have done in the four or five years I was gone uh, is fabulous. I, I think, you know, on the time, if, if we owned all the property and the shovels and the machinery was out there ready to start paving and digging the pond, I would say, well, Mr. Destin, I, you know, dang, man, we should have put that this in, yeah. that ship has sailed, but that ship hadn't sailed. That ship's not going to sail for another year and a half. Another year and a half. And so we're going to take four weeks and look at, and if you come back and say, well, it's a half a million more, and it's going to cost this, and it's going to take this much time, I might tell Mr. Destin, I like you, and I want as much green space in this city as possible, but, you know, I, I'm a very fiscally conservative person, and uh, I, I'm not going to be able to support you. But at this point, at the 60% solution, uh, I think we ought to look at leaving a legacy of a, as much park space, green space, in that part of town, I mean, the nearest big park is probably Maddie Kelly up by Joe's Bayou, right? I mean, the people there want a park too, just like the people in Kellar Gardens want a park, you know? I would just say, what's this cost us? Four weeks? Okay, well, that's less than a year and a half when we finally get the property. Let's do the right thing. Let's be something that we can be proud of and that our kids can be proud of, that we all can, can share in. Mr. Destin, you said you were about to make a motion. Ms. Uh, Abair, you want to wait and let him make a motion, or you want to make your comment first? And I got well, you, Ms. I, I can make the motion and make the comment at the same time, Mayor. Well, that way we can uh, uh, do it proper. You make the yes. motion, get a second. We'll have final discussion. I got Kevin and Ms. Abair yeah. want to make a comment. And anyone I will, else? Uh, I will make a motion that we direct the uh, engineers to look at exfiltration as a ways to reduce the size of the retention pond. I got a motion. Do second. I have a second? I got a second. First up, Ms. Abair, and then Mr. Schmidt. Well, my question was basically the, the, what Mr. Babby was saying is we don't have access to these properties. They're not ours yet. We have nothing that we can do at least for the next four to eight weeks. This guy could go out, get what a, a bid, an idea of what it would cost, and then come back to us and say, mm, this is what it is. It's going to take this much more money. And at that point, we can say, never mind, go with what we started with. Is that correct? Is that correct, city manager? That's what the motion is. And that's pretty much where we're at with the property. Nothing's going to start being built. Nothing can be until we're done with those purchases, correct? That's okay. correct. Thank, that's my clarification. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I just jump in just for clarification sure. on, the, on the motion itself? Um, uh, uh, did you want to put a time frame on when you would like to see that back? What time frame do you need for look at exfiltration? Four weeks. Four weeks. That's fine. All right. I got Mr. Smith and then Mr. Destin and then Mr. King. Uh, did you want to weigh in or did you say your, your piece? Four weeks. Okay. That was my question. Thank you. Uh, all right. Go ahead. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you give uh, any re reminder of how long and wide that this pond two is, roughly? Yeah, it's about 600 feet long, and at its narrowest, it is... Would you be the finger side? Two. Yeah, the finger side about 30 feet. Um, I think at its longest, you're probably around... 50, 60 feet. And then the idea is to possibly come back starting at the finger point 
this drainage to give us some flat area, you won't know how much we can get until you go back and start working on the drawing board? Correct. And is it is it a viable option that we're having like a flat? It's flat. Is that what this potentially would do? So it's the, still going to have a swell. The narrow part, the finger part, that one would be flat, and then you would still retain that east pond. That currently now the the seven foot one, but the depth of that will will change sure. and you know be determined by that and, evaluation. And, and currently. If, if we just keep rolling with how we got it, can people still put their towels down underneath the palm tree and, and lay and, and get sun, like your, these pictures? Yes, correct. If we just kept kept it on? Yeah, the slopes so are... So are, are we worried about people falling in, in, in a pond? No, drop-off condition um, is is safe. We, you know, we don't have any concern with drop-off condition with pedestrians. So I, I like, I'm, I mean, I'm conservative as well, but we're talking about stroking a $50,000 check just to see possibly... I mean, it's not about time for me either because we got plenty of time, but now we're talking about money. Yeah. And we're talking about $50,000 that we've already paid your company once to do this 10 years ago, like Mr. Bagby said. Now we're paying your company twice. Here we are again. Maybe three times. And $50,000, and then we might come back and say, well, it's a half a million dollar project. We're not going to do it. There goes $50,000. I'm glad we looked at it. And I personally don't, I, I love the park spaces. I love green spaces, but I don't think there was never a plan to build a park here. And, I, I still don't think it sounds like we can build a park here. Um, and as it is, I can go out there and walk through it as it is if I wanted to. Even if there was a little bit of park space, I don't know if I'm going to be going kicking a soccer ball around a t the, the two-lane road, the, the Crosstown Connector with my kid right there next to the highway. Be like, you know, it just seems like a not an area to really use as a recreational park, maybe some benches, but I think you said we can do benches and do some things to aesthetically appeal to a green space and a park space. So, uh, you know, I, I'd like, I'd rather use that 0.9 acres space to do, a, you know, like you did the Pensacola thing. I mean, that's a that's awesome. perfect 0.9 acres to do right there. And we still have the walk around here. So, I, I mean, I know we have time, but I, I don't think it's a good use of the money um, that's not really planned out. And so I, I hope we can just, keep moving forward as is so that's my okay thought. we're gonna let everybody have a round here and then we'll take uh take uh, mr Desson's uh motion to a vote mr Desson, you have another round sir and then uh, next will be the city manager you still want to make comment nope okay so uh you're up mr Destin, and then it'll be mr king go ahead yeah um uh, and thanks mayor um i'm glad we did get the dimensions of that pond two football fields long 50 feet wide and the motion is to try to reduce the size of that as much as, it, as we can through exfiltration and, and create all of that land that will in fact be green space. Um, and as far as voting for this area to be a park, we in fact did vote and the motion passed to use as much of this as we could as recreational space so that we could provide a park-like atmosphere in this part of town where there is none. Can I ask you a question, though? What, what, as it is, doesn't allow us to provide it as a space to go throw the ball and use it as a park? Like, I, I'm not understanding, is it a concern of a safety issue? It's not really suitable for recreation or paths or anything else, unless you want to be recreating down the bottom of a seven-foot hole. hole. It's, it doesn't look, nor will it be able to function as a recreational area that I would envision the area needs to be. Is your drawing fairly accurate that it shows it's just a long slope as it goes down to that seven foot and then rolls back up on both sides? Yes, so we took the contours from our, our corridor design and transferred that into right, the, thank, the graphics. Thank you. You had your hand up. Would you like to weigh in, ma'am? No, I was just trying to help out with the pushing of the buttons up there. <laughs> I've got it. All right, Mr. Destiny, you done with your comments? Okay, Mr. Bagby, and after that, we're going to go ahead and take this motion to a vote. Okay, oh. uh, two things. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh. I apologize. Yeah, Mr. Mr. King, go ahead. That's that button pushing thing you got were talking it. about. Um, 
And this is kind of, kind of along the lines of what Teresa said was, you know, what do we, what do we lose by, you know, what are we losing? Fifty. I, I understand the money. That's a that's a possibility. That's not a. That's a potential. It could be more than fifty thousand dollars. That's just. That's just their time. We're talking about construction as well. I mean, that's a. You're talking about digging a digging a hole with an excavator and and using that dirt. Cost. Yeah, I mean that's a cost that I'm sure we've got factored in here. We're going to use the dirt from this retention pond to, you know, for the rest of the project. So we lose that. On top of that, we've got God knows how many hundreds of thousands of dollars it's going to cost to put this exfiltration system in. I understand it. I get it. I like that. I would love that. But my, I had someone call me today, and they said, man, it seems like all the government does is spend, spend, spend. And I'm like, yes, that's true. And I, I, don't, I understand where he's coming from. That was a sentiment he shared with me today. Um, it seems a little... Un, it seems a little unnecessary being that we're going to have this this whole pond here so my, my main question is what do we lose what are we losing in time if we do kick the can a little bit further down the road for four weeks fifty thousand dollars and it'll still be a park i mean it's not like we're losing a whole park it's That's still going to be a park mr bagby we're going to wind it up with you Your thank you mr words. mayor let let me Get some clarification because maybe I misunderstood. Sure. Are we? What are we doing with the dirt that we dig out for the retention pond? That's a lot of dirt you're moving. That's a lot of trucks. Where is it going? Is it going to go in that area? It. I would have to look at the excavation and, and fill numbers. I don't know the the balance on the project. Okay. So we don't know where it's going, but I'm looking at because we have the pond on the west end also, the other pond. You know, which is getting excavated so probably not digging all that dirt building up anything because that's a lot of dirt that's going to have to be hauled off uh, but I wanted to confirm you said the it was 600 feet long right and how wide did you say it was I think it on the narrow end it's about 30 feet and I think it goes to about 50 or 60 50 or 60 and the okay. 600 is basically from your back of sidewalk mm -hmm. yeah, that's to sidewalk right. That's right. So on the 60 foot wide portion, which is on the east end, right? Okay, is that where the seven foot drop is? Yes. Okay, and on a four to one slope, that would be 28 feet, right? 28 feet on the south side mm -hmm. and 28 feet on the north side. Now, engineers should never do math in public, but that's 56 <laughs> feet out of 60 feet. So you have a nice flat little four foot wide place where you can kick your ball. The rest of it, you, and, and everybody knows what a four to one slope is. If you don't, you know, I'll take you to my house. Yeah, if and that's show the you. case, my, my widths are incorrect. So okay. the, the cross sections, you know, we can look at that and see what those numbers are, but I don't have yeah, those in front of me. I guess, so. I guess my thing is, and I, I don't want, I'm not here to beat you up, man. I'm just, you know, there, there are assertions and we're going to spend 50,000. You don't know how much we're going to spend, do you? I don't know how cost. much we're no, going to spend it, and nobody up here knows. And we can throw out numbers. We can throw out a hundred thousand. We can throw out a million dollars. Not a single person in this room knows how much it's going to cost. And I think Mr. Dessen's motion is for you to come back in four weeks and tell us how much is it going to cost. I've, I've got it pulled up from the uh, month ago there, Mr. Mayor. If you want to go look at the uh, cross section of the pond, uh, you can, you can look at it on my uh, computer. But uh, so all. That, that's why I support the motion. We're not here to beat you up. We're not here to beat each other up. Let's just see. You, you come back and you tell us what's it going to cost, and, and we're then we'll to, make a decision. We're happy to give you the best product. But that, that, that option is a fifty thousand dollar option. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Johnny, yes, it is. No, he does. He just told you he does not know how much it's going to cost to do that. Was the, I mistaken when the you said that this research is going to be the the time to evaluate the option? Uh, that is what we're talking about. Yeah, four to six weeks. He knows that. But he's going to charge. He's going to charge the city for four, for fifty thousand dollars. So did you just charge us fifty thousand dollars? It's been four weeks since you made your last presentation. You came back with some modifications. How much is? How much did that add to our cost? That one was thirteen thousand dollars. Okay. So, that's that's a long way from fifty thousand dollars. But, but but Jim, he he. 
Mr. We, Mayor, I, I, we asked him to give us three-dimensional renderings of what it would look like, and he has. When you're talking about your slopes of speculation, I don't, I don't, I don't see that in these red renderings. So are are these are these renderings an error? The renderings are accurate. There is the large portion of the pond. That's and yeah, you know, we can look at the cross sections and get that measurement. Then there is that narrow finger portion, which you're correct. I'm not gonna that has I don't get the a narrow So let's narrow take about can, can we go back over what the what Mr. Uh, yeah, I'll re re um, uh, Ray go over the motion and we will take a vote. We're gonna be here all night. And I don't get to vote anyway. So Motion is directed. I think. <clears throat> well, maybe, maybe so. I guess is Mr. Braden here? Did he leave? <clears throat> Mr. Braden has left for the evening. <laughs> well, I do get to vote if there's a tie. <laughs> Drum roll, please. <laughs> now let's go. <laughs> go ahead, Ray. Re redo the. Uh, Redo the uh, motion is to direct the project engineer to explore the idea of reducing the footprints of the pond and adding extra exfiltration piping. There you go. All right, in four weeks, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, there we go. We're going to go ahead and take a vote. All the members will do it. Votes are locked. Or do I have to vote? You have to hit confirm. Uh, do I hit confirm? After you vote, yeah. Do then hit the word confirm. It said, it said tiebreaker. I'm, I'm not the tiebreaker, am I? Hit that, yes, you are. So hit confirm before I vote? You hit yes or no, and then hit. Oh, okay. Motion fails. You don't go anywhere. Just keep going. Okay. Thank you. Lance. I move that the city council direct the city manager to authorize the continued design of the Destin Crosstown connector to the 90% phase. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. No further discussion. Let's take a vote. Ayes have it. So moved. Lance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Next up is uh, item 4E, which is uh, a review of our strategic plan for FY23, just the strategic council goals and strategic council objectives. And I have a few slides just to show to give some history before we, and I will move through this very quickly. Um, as you remember during our visioning session, um, I had asked council to do their best to stay the course, to not make um, any unnecessary changes, but to make the changes they felt necessary. Just so you know, at this point in our strategic planning process, we are at a decision-making point um, where you will give us directions so staff can expend resources to do research and planning um, that we can bring back, especially in the uh, budget workshops that will begin in the May-June timeframe. Next slide, please. Um, quick review of the priorities, the, the way that we classify the items on our strategic plan. We have three, three priority levels. Critical is an objective that must be successfully accomplished. Important, a priority that can have a significant impact on performance. The resource, resources are fixed and the vari variable is either time or the objective. And finally, we have desirable priorities, um, a priority that is where both the resources and the time are variables. Um, the bottom line with desirable is if we run out of resources for a critical priority or an important priority, we will probably go to the, one of the desirable priorities and shift the resources from that project to the critical or important priority. Next slide, please. So our current Council objectives are listed here. I, I don't need to read them to you. Um, you all, I think, have your current sheet with all the council objectives and priorities on them, um, and they are posted on the wall um, to my left. 
the strategic goals, um, that the way that the um, strategic visioning session ended, one tweak was made to the strategic goals, um, which was to um, reorganize um, where, where each one of them fell. And the main shift was a green and sustainable environment was listed last. Um, not that it is any less important, but um, it was put there um, because currently the council's objectives, um, they don't have one that falls under that. I will say um, just for folks out there, um, so you understand that the city is concerned about green and sustainable environment, that a great deal of the staff objectives would fall underneath this pillar. Next slide, please. So the strategic goals, I'm sorry, the critical priorities um, that came out of the visioning session um, really did not change. There were two changes and um, that left the offer, offering livable wages and benefits uh, to attract and maintain high caliber qualified staff as the number one priority. A uh, shift that staff interpreted from what we heard during the variety was 1.2. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? 1.2, um, that's a shift which says research viability of multi-use convention sports community center, phase one feasibility study. That was prior to that in the current plan is under the desire, desirable section. So the third bucket of priorities. So I just need to confirm and when you vote later, you will be confirming that we moved that to the correct place. If that's not correct, that's okay because none of this is adopted by you guys yet. This, uh, we were just trying to interpret what we heard. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so that leaves the important or the level two priorities. Um, all of these were, are currently in the plan, so that's complete the two-lane crosstown connector, um, continue with public beachfront acquisitions, and uh, continue with the undergrounding of utilities. There's a fourth one in there on the next slide that um, I'm asking for, for guidance from the council on, and that originally was the Zerby Street Calhoun Avenue Phase 2, which would put a pedestrian pathway, pathway under the Marler Bridge, which we've done some research and planning on. Um, but we do have information from FDOT that right at this time, um, it does not seem like a viable option, but it could again be a viable option in the future when they go to replace the bridge. So my question is, um, and there's some other viable op ways it could be an option in the future, just not right now. So my question is, do we want to um, just table um, this item for this, so staff doesn't expend any more resources on it and wait and see, or do we want to shift the resources to another location? And we are looking at the Stallman Avenue intersection right now, and that will be involved in the current PD&E study that's going on from FDOT, and that would give us some, some potential funding to use at, at that intersection. And that's a council decision. Right? So my, we can leave it on there and just leave it where it is. We can shift it down to a third level bucket or we can table it or we can shift the resources. That's a council decision. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see these were all already there. So that leads me to the last slide, which is where we're at right now. Um, I'm, I'm looking for council to tell me if, if there are any additions or deletions, modifications, or reprioritizations that council would like to see us do on the final version. Um, for anyone thinking that we have a bunch more information that needs to be approved, um, that this will be incorporated once we, we come back from the budget workshops and staff will reestablish um, the staff objectives and this will all come back to you as a final plan to be approved. Um, if you, for those of you here, were, who are here, this was approved in the July time frame last year. So, Ray, could you clear my thing so I can uh, see uh, who wants to weigh in on this for, for the city manager? I had hit the voting button, hit button one too many times. All right, so uh, Mr. Bagby, you're up, and then Mr. Smith. Yeah. Can you put that well, <clears throat> Lance, before I can answer your question, and I don't know if I, I need to make a motion to table this item until after the mayor's presentation, um, because I know we have $75,000 budgeted in this, year, this year's budget. 
right, to do this study for the multi-purpose use convention center, you know, everybody, one, everybody I talk to and everybody I listen to up here seems to have a different idea of where this is going to be, what it's going to be, how it's going to be, you know, some of us think, oh, the community center and the museum and the parking lot and we're going to redo all of that and maybe put a tunnel underneath, you know, 98 and some people say, no, we're going to go down where the, uh, the old, um, not Walmart, Kmart was and, yeah, I know. Oh, but it's it's something different for everybody. So, really, until the mayor, I mean, I don't think we need to spend seventy five thousand uh, dollars. It definitely doesn't need to be a priority to look at because until we decide what we want and where we want it, you know, we're worried about fifty thousand dollars, seventy five thousand already in the budget, and we're just going to spend it to do a study we don't even know what we want or where we want it so I, I'd like to make a motion to table this item or to pull the mayor's item up so we can hear what what you want yeah we can do that I'm gonna make you happy because my recommendation is not to spend seventy five thousand dollars on a feasibility study thank once, you <laughs> once once I uh, so what we'll do then uh, do we need a, a, a formal motion to, to change that? Because we were supposed to do it at the very beginning of the thing, to change the order of the uh, agenda. Yeah, you can set aside the order of the day and move that item up if you would. Okay, okay. Council I, I'll make receive. that motion. And just discuss okay. now. I'll second it. Okay, I have a motion, I have a second. Let's go ahead, uh, clear this, and we'll take a vote on the change of items. And so I'll be moving H2 uh, to right now. Eyes have it so moved. Um, because seeing how the, the city manager does want some clarifying and approval of, of the visioning session, I will t bring you up to speed to the best of my ability of where we are now with the city center. And for clarity, that's what we're going to call this project is the city center just so to help a little bit of the confusion that Mr. Bagby spoke of. Um, uh, we recognize that our 32-year-old community center over on the west side of town is, doesn't serve our community. We also recognize that we have a town center CRA that's uh, languished in debt for, since 2005, and, and the whole purpose of the CRAs is to spur redevelopment, uh, not only just to increase our tax base, but to make our city a better city. And uh, the, back in 2005, when they um, um, improved Airport Road and Underground Main Street, that was the goal and idea, I believe, of everybody that supported that project at the time, was to begin a new footprint for Destin. Uh, we've been speaking about, uh, through our visioning sessions and our uh, feasibility, our uh, mobility fee study, talking about new sidewalks and view corridor with the undergrounding in 98 and so the idea of a city center actually started with me of wanting a multi-use uh, event center so we could have uh, some cultural events concerts and, and that kind of stuff um, uh, ice hockey which is a selfish reason but if when you're the mayor you can present selfish ideas and, and, and so, but that's, that's how it started and that was before the property it was bought by another uh, company um, um, a multi-use uh, uh, facility now that we have our own high school now is even more appealing from just that particular uh, uh, development of that one item but since then after talking with people that have vision and, and, and sh share a love for the community they said well why don't we you know we got really a, 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 a real severe need for more recreational space why don't we move City Hall and the City Hall Annex up there in the middle of the city in the city center proposal and and use this land for more ball fields so you you satisfy two things at one time our city hall is 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 old our community center is old we could put them both in in the same location uh since we've we've been talking there's a piece of property adjacent to the 21 acres that already has a huge gymnasium uh, office space that could house every agency that that we have in, in the city right now and and so things are starting to come together 
Publix bought the land and they have hired a, a development team in Atlanta that do, normally does their work. I have not spoken with either one of them. We are working with some of our team members here in, in the, in the, the uh, community that, that can have a part in this, but uh, uh, up till today, I haven't had a personal face-to-face -face meeting with a representative of Publix. Uh, they have presented a preliminary plan to our community development program. Uh, Lewis and I have talked about it. Um, we, we decided before we actually kind of share our vision of what a city center would entail, uh, compassed around their new uh, uh, grocery store or retail outlet, that, that we probably have to have a little clearer idea of. So my recommendation and what I was going to talk about tonight is talking with Shane Moody, who's the you know, CEO of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and with uh, uh, Stephen from uh, uh, Beachworks, is we felt that before we did a face-to-face -face with Publix and shared this, my idea of what a city center would be, that it would probably be very beneficial for this council to go up to Atlanta um, get recompensated for their expenditures, but Shane was supposed to reach out to some of you prior to this meeting tonight, but is gonna send an official invite or tomorrow, inviting you to come up one at a time. I've cleared it with Kyle, make sure that we don't violate any uh, uh, sunshine violations, but allow each one of you to go up to Alpharetta and check out their city center, how they redevelop their small community in Avalon, um, uh, is, is another community short by it. They took a little bit different approach to their development of the city center to give all of you and myself a three-dimensional view of the possibilities of what we could locate on the adjacent properties to what uh, uh, Publix wants. Uh, we are under the assumption that they're going to need about six to nine acres of that 21 acres for their retail deal. We do uh, believe that they're going to scrape and rebuild, so it's not a renovation. So that means all that area, and of course there's a lot of outlying properties around there and the, the, the uh, church uh, who's interested in sales. So now all of a sudden instead of 21 acres, we're talking 36 to 38 acres. And that's where you start thinking about a city hall with a hardened emergency management center in it so Michael and his staff could stay on scene, uh, a new city hall uh, for, for our, our offices, um, a new community center that is big enough and expansive enough to not only meet the needs in 2022, but also, we, you know, well into the next decade or two. Uh, we already see an immediate need with our high school right now for a new community center and athletic uh, 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 development for the you know ba basketball, soccer, indoor soccer, volleyball stuff like that. That also falls in play with a with a uh, multi-use event center. So now we're not talking just about conventions; we're talking about uh, basketball tournaments. Um, you know, in a, in a center that size, you can have four basketball courts going at one time. So now all of a sudden we're talking about an all-encompassing project that not only meets individual, our citizens' needs, our business needs, but more importantly, there's, there's a lot of property between Main Street and Destin that has almost been waiting in the wings for something to happen to spur redevelopment in our Harbor District. The undergrounding in 98, which has been a passion of Mr. Dessens and others, is to change that view corridor. So everything is kind of lining up to where not only would this change our entrance into our CRA and spur economic development in an area that we really need it into where we can finally pay our debt on it, but more importantly, it would go to the west as well. It would spur new development uh, uh, into our harbor district, and that could range anything from boutique hotels, to lifestyle centers. Uh, this pandemic has taught us more than anything else is that people don't have to live where they work to make a living. People can live anywhere and make a living. And what a better place to live than, than here in Destin. And I don't know if you've seen what they've done in Pensacola, but they got lifestyle centers, which are actually nice condominiums where the people pull into their condominium, park in their condominium, 
and live on the outside edges with retail spaces underneath. You build three or four of those and all of a sudden you have a walking retail living community, which is ideal, of course, for our Harbor District on the north side. So the city center is a grand vision. I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna look and that's why we're gonna invite all of you to go see some of the possibilities because it's easier as we saw today with our 60% plan, it's easier to see something in real life and formulate a vision than to see it uh, with a architectural drawing. So uh, that's where we're at today. I think our, our meeting with Publix will be soon, but I really, I, I feel like it's paramount that we take uh, the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce's offer and Beachworks offer to uh, allow you guys to come up there, spend a day, half a day, take a tour, uh, Ray will uh, set up the accommodations and stuff. It's all clear with our attorney. You'll go up there one by one, take a tour of these uh, 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 projects, get your own vision of what a city center can be or, or look like, and then when we come back together, we can, we can start formulating that plan. Uh, it's lofty and it's visionary, but uh, I think this city, since 1985, it's time for some lofty and visionary uh, approaches to what we do. Uh, we changed the comp plan because we wanted a different quality of development and life in this city. And I think this vision fits that. Um, more importantly, the timing is right uh, for our community. We have a lot of areas that have served their time and it's time for a facelift. And, and I think so. so uh, this piece of property as it stands, even though public's bought it, is one of a kind. It's almost like we're almost too late to the dance, but we're not too late in my opinion. Uh, so the possibilities are still there. We haven't closed the door on it. And, and the, going up there for y'all to go up there and take a look at these city centers is gonna be a hell of a lot cheaper than $75,000 um, uh, you know, study on the feasibility of it because there is no feasibility if you can't grasp a hold of that type of vision. And I think, so this is a cheaper, cheaper version of that. We have uh, money for this kind of thing for you to be re recompensated for your travel and your accommodations. And um, uh, I just would encourage all of you to take this opportunity and this invite and we'll start there. And then uh, after y'all come back, uh, you know, we, we can start having a discussion. And at some point, yes, we might have to do a feasibility study, but I don't want to waste one single dime outside of this travel experience before we go any bit further. Uh, Time is of the essence, but fortunately we have some time. And that's, that's my report to y'all at, at this particular time. Mr. Uh, Ms. Abner. Thanks, Mayor. I was just uh, gonna say that I think that's a fantastic idea. I, I think we do need to do something with that whole area and I'm happy that Publix has bought it. And I think that if we can all get a eyeball look on somewhere else that's done something with that type of property that we have I think this just will behoove us to help our citizens and help our city so I think it's a great idea I'll look forward to the date they set it up for me Johnny thank you sir yeah I just wanted to say that I feel the same way I think this is this kind of project is the reason that I ran for desk city council um, I think you know of the last 35 years we've seen that shopping center, that area, die, yeah. And I think like, I mean, what a, just an incredible opportunity to do something that, like Mr. Bagby said, that you can ride by and be proud of, you know? It just, it gets me all, gets me all excited. And I talked to Shane the other day about doing the Alpharetta thing. I think that's a, it's an awesome idea. I spent most of my, most of my vacations as a child riding through neighborhoods looking at gates and mailboxes and stuff I thought was so stupid as a kid and now it's like I want to go do that you know it's gonna be, it's gonna be good so, Mr. Mr. Wagner awesome well will Pepitos be there still <laughs> all depends on your vision sir <laughs> no um, I'm in favor of it I'm in favor of us on the forefront bringing creativity and vision into the project versus the 60%. I think that's been my biggest frustration of learning government has been the slow steps it takes to come up with mediocrity and just push fast 
approaches to things. So I'm all in favor of coming up with a creative vision that are both of value and of a conservative budgeting. And before uh, I, I look to Mr. Destin, the timeline here is before I meet with them on a personal basis and to share some of our dreams and aspirations, I, I really want to for you all to go take a look and come back. So when I share the vision and aspiration, it's the whole councils and not just Gary Jarvis want an ice skating rink. Mm -hmm. that, Where? That, that, that's the key. So that's uh, why I, I think the, cha the uh, chamber has offered and, and Steve from uh, uh, Beachworks will be the guide because he's an Atlanta guy, even though he lives and has a company here in Destin, mm -hmm. that will give you each a, 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 a tour and not just a show you around tour, but can explain to you the processes and how, how these type of things could take place. And in each one of those projects are different. They got green spaces and places for farmer markets in some locations. There's multi-structured parking to address some of the parking issues. There's a, there's a whole gamut. There's a little pieces and parts of everything that we may need to incorporate to create a true city center. Because what you're doing is you're not just, you know, public's got to park, you know, if they're there, there's always going to be traffic, but we're, we're bringing our, community center in there and everybody knows how busy that place is from daylight to dark or way past dark so so it's really going to be a uh, uh, an emotional and a community driven environment virtually 365 days a year from daylight to yeah i'm all for that dark, so. is those two locations just because that's where you guys have the connections for those two locations Look record. Just go ahead and push a button. Oops. Let's start. There we go. I'm Stephen Franco. Um, so we talked with the mayor about several of the you know city centers that have been developed all around Atlanta, especially in recent years. Uh, after really looking at it, and y'all know my background in real estate for many many years, I think the city of Alpharetta Town Center probably best represents the even from just a size standpoint of the part subject parcel we're talking about and then just the quality of the town centers that have been done in Atlanta I think it's a, a great uh, a, a great comparison for us to look at Av Avalon is just five minutes down the street and what I like about Avalon it it may be a little more dense than we want to go here I'm not sure you know you, you guys can look and decide but there are features of Avalon for example that ha that are just spectacular that you know you like the mayor said we can take different things and incorporate them and and from just the ease of just having you guys in the way you're coming in and stuff we just thought that was the best to show you and to try to do so in a in a, in a succinct way but just for the right what's that hands on seeing it there's no there is the mr mayor's right that there's no replacement for going and really seeing these things and seeing how they've been done and uh you know we're not reinventing the wheel it's there's there's a way to do these things and we can do it as i said the other time I came up here before, smart growth. I'll, we'll use that term a lot too. Smart growth is the key to how we do it. And um, but if you guys are there and anybody wants to take more time and it's allowed, whatever the proper rules are, I'm happy to show y'all in different places around town. I mean, I'll be up there that whole week. So whatever we can do to accommodate you to see what you need to see, but those two should take care of it mostly. Thank, Thank you, you Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Destin. Um, do we have an idea of budget to to take the council up there? Is we have money in the budget, travel money for the uh, council? Yes, sir. There's uh, just over $11,000 in the travel budget for council this year. Okay. And while I'm happy to go look, I want us to all understand that we've had no contact with the public's people nor the developer. And it doesn't hurt to go look and dream. But that's pretty key to this. And the other key is money to build this and do this with. It's a great idea. I just don't want to get all dressed up and no party to go to eventually. So <laughs> we'll go look, though. Well, that, there he is. And, 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 and that's the whole purpose behind this approach, uh, Dewey, is because this is a cost-effective way to approach it before we do delve into it. Uh, as far as the, the, you know, when you start putting those types of things together uh, and you're starting to talk about a P3, uh, uh, type of program uh, uh, development 
uh, all, we don't have to look very far to see the possibilities of what happens when private business and public monies come together. Uh, all you got to do is look at Pensacola un under Vince Studer's leadership and, and, and the, their city council and their mayor and the things that they've accomplished in the last seven to eight years. That is, uh, and, and you know, you don't have to, you don't have to drive to Atlanta to see that. You can go see it tomorrow. And, and, and just to get a, a, an idea of, of, they took, they had historical buildings, which we don't, but they took the historical place and, and enhanced it and made it the best it could be. And, and I think what we're trying to do here is to get a vision of taking what we have and turn it into something like that we've never had. And when it, when, especially when you're talking about um, uh, an idea of this magnitude, um, there'll be some public monies involved, but the private monies will come. It's just, it's just, you're, you're talking about an economic engine that feeds itself. And, and that's, that's what's happened in these other communities. They, it took some vision and some guidance, but the economic aspect of it, uh, it followed suit. And I, and I have full confidence in that. Uh, we both have good friends that own a lot of property on Highway 98, and, and, and they've been waiting for some time for this type of talk or, or about a vision and redevelopment. It started with, it started with two items, the, the new comp plan and the undergrounding in 98, and this is just, this is just a, a, a continuance of that type of vision that was uh, exuded on those two items. Mr. Bagby. Thank you, Mayor. I'm supportive. I understand what Mr. Destin says. Uh, usually these things, and you're right, Alpharetta has historic buildings, which we don't. We have a bunch of teardowns, quite honestly, in, in most of this space. Uh, I also note that there's about seven acres of parks within about six blocks of the Alpharetta Town Center also. You know, so you, you talk about what we're going to build, but it, those green spaces those parks are part of that legacy where it's a walkable community. You know, in 2005, when we first started talking about this in 2006, you know, we were going to build or encourage the building of live work units, uh, a little bit like the Rosemary Beach Town Center. And everybody complained that I wanted to turn Destin and Rosemary Beach. And I said, you'll never be Rosemary Beach, but they'll never be Destin. We have something special here. Uh, and we, we can build on that, and I, I'm encouraged that we want to build on it. But it is, you know, we need a champion. Uh, Pensacola's got a champion, Mr. Studer and his family, you know, and, and I thought maybe Mark McDonald and his group out of Nashville who own the property across Main Street would be that champion, but uh, it doesn't appear that they're going to be. But we have some local champions that might step up to the plate. But that's what it takes. It takes somebody who's going to make that investment, not just the city, because we can't do it on our own, who's going to say, I'll be the first one, and I'll build that live work, and I need you to give me a little bit more density, or I need you to give me a little bit more of this, and everybody's going to go, oh, my God, no. They're, they're building, you know, downtown Atlanta. So <laughs> all I say is temp temper your excitement, because uh, all we're doing now is dreaming. Well. I refuse to do that because I'm the champion. Yeah. This is what I've envisioned our community. I, let me tell you what, I may not have that check, but I can get in, in about the first Tuesday of November, I'm going to stop on, be on the other side of that podium, and I will be the champion for our community to, to develop itself into something more special than it is all right. I want continual uh, uh, well-being of our community in our economy. It's the only way this fleet is going to survive, is if the city continues to grow and improve. And so that's my goal. So uh, this is an idea. I'm going to champion the idea. I'm encouraging you guys to take part of this invite from our chamber to go and, and see if you can um, grasp the excitement of the idea. Uh, I know you two guys especially have been here before. You will always be a voice of reason, not to discourage, but to bring us back to, to earth. But uh, uh, the, the people that would be um, encouraged to invest in this type of project are there. 
I know I'm not going to write a check for $60 million because I can't, but I do know there's people that can right now. And, 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 and we still got triumph fundings. We, we still got, I don't want to kill the dream before we go look and see. Go look and, see. and that's all, that's all I'm encouraging. Shane, um, you're going to give the formal invite tomorrow via email with the times and schedules. Come on, come on up and, and, and share with uh, your idea. Uh, I've been mainly on this whole deal after you guys gave me the approval. I've been working with uh, uh, Waterworks and with Shane. Uh, uh, trying to develop and with Lewis trying to develop uh, how to go through this process and this is our recommendation this is where we start to to get the uh, dream of the city center into reality and it starts with the all with this recommendation Before go ahead in, Johnny, and I, Johnny Mr. King and I had already said this was a great idea and then the conversation went on then you came in so tell us what your thoughts and I apologize for being late. I had a dinner I had to go to. I've been going 100 miles an hour since 7.15 this morning. So if I'm out of breath, I apologize for that, too. Um, this has been an idea that you, you all, we've been talking about for a couple of years, I think. And now I think the opportunity is finally in front of us. I agree. we got to have money. But I think it takes the vision and the concept and the idea before the money comes along. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking my phone calls and taking my voicemail. Um, the, one, the one I didn't talk to down there on the end, um, but I did leave him a voicemail. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And all of you are very open and, and, and honest about you think this is a good idea. Um, you know, I, I tried to turn this, this visit to Atlanta into something the chamber could make money off of, and I wanted to notice that all of y'all were going up there, and I was going to charge $800 a person, but Kyle said, no, that wouldn't work. So we had to change it, and, and my conversation with Dewey was, you know, hey, he said, I worried about sunshine laws. I said, it's one at a time, morning or afternoon. You get to choose over four days. Um, Stephen's going to be up there. Um, I can't stay Thursday afternoon because i got to get back for chamber breakfast on Friday morning, but um, th this is a good opportunity. Um, I think we've got an opportunity not just with that property but with a couple of adjacent properties we've made some good progress on a couple of the adjacent properties um th that we think could can contribute to this as well um until i talk to the mayor and we get a direction on that um i don't, don't want to say anything too public about that but this would be you know everybody talks about we form these cras and nothing's happened well here's a chance to make something happen um, if we can get in front of the company that's, that's, that's bought this, and I think we can because they've submitted plans to the city already, um, you know, we've, get, we've got that contact, we've got that in with them. Uh, this would be, and y'all have heard me say this before, I said it when we did uh, uh, Leonard Destin Park, you know, the big buzzwords in my world right now are transformational and generational. This would be transformational and generational. Y'all talk about leaving something, a, a legacy for your kids and their kids, this would be it. Um, you know, an event center, city hall, a community center, um, retail, office, restaurants. Um, it, it, it's, you know, and, and this is my background. I mean, this is how I was raised in the chamber business was doing these kinds of things. So the Alpharetta is a, is a great place to go to. It's easy. Well, if you have to drive through Atlanta, but which I just did twice this past weekend. Um, so other than that, it, it's, it, it's, it's fairly easy to get to. Um, I don't know if, if Ray knows it, but he's going to be in charge of making all your hotel reservations. Um, and the email that you're going to get tomorrow, I cleared with Kyle. Kyle has approved. He said it's all good. Um, um, I've got it on my computer. I hadn't, had, wasn't in my office today. I won't be tomorrow except for our new member reception late. And then I don't think I'll be in my office Wednesday afternoon because of meetings all day. But I'll get it to you all tomorrow. Um, I think the dates are April 5th through the 7th. And if we have to go to Friday the 8th, we can do that. Stephen will be up there and be glad to take you. If we have to do one of you at 9 in the morning and one of you at 11 and one at 2 and one at 4, we can do that. We're flexible. So don't think it just has to be one in the morning and one in the afternoon each day. Um, and all of that's in all that's in the email that you'll get tomorrow. And, you know, per my phone call, it was just a heads up that you're going to be that the mayor was going to talk about this tonight and um, without details, but just that the mayor was going to talk about this tonight and that um, you were going to get the email from me on Tuesday. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, I appreciate your openness and your accepting of, of what we're trying to do here. Um, and again, transformational and generational, and that's how we look at it. Is that good? You're welcome. All right. 
Well, that's all I got to report. We got other items on the agenda, so that's where we're at. Now we can go back to our vision document and um, do what Lance needs. So go ahead. Lance, you want to go back and start back? Or you, because uh, I got Kevin wants to make a motion. Very are you, good. Are you Could done? You put that document up, please. Okay. I got you, Kevin, after Lance gets done here. All right, go ahead, Lance. Can you blow it up? Okay, thank you. Um, up on the screen, I know it's hard to read, I apologize, but that's the summary of the, the two major changes. Um, you can scroll down, because the strategic goals is just a, purely the sequence. So there's the two um, changes that were discussed. I want council to understand that, I mean, this is your document, so any other changes, modifications you want to make, you, you, you can make those. Um, and you have copies of this in your um, packet, because I know that's impossible to read unless you guys are a lot better than me. But we would just entertain um, some direction from y'all. And if we need to tweak the title of anything to make it make, some, make more sense, that's, this would be a good time to do that too. All right, Kevin. Yeah, I'm going to give this a shot here. Good so I'm going to uh, tweak this a little bit, I guess. So I'm going to move to adopt the FY 2023 Council Strategic Objectives uh, with the following changes. Uh, give me one second. I would like to, with the following changes, 1.2 being critical priority and update the title to work with stakeholders to pursue the Destin City Center and to table 1.6 until further notice. Second. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> well, I gotta go back to it, you know, and and instruct staff to begin their research and planning for future budget workshops with the city council. Got a second. motion? Got a second? Mr. Bagby. Yeah, I'm I'm fine with that. I just <clears throat> because this is the first document on mm -hmm. the budget development, really for FY twenty three. So I kinda understand what the outcomes are for 1.1 could you help me or the mayor help me with what the outcomes sure. of the expected revised 1.2 are other than do a viability yeah. study for the new town center I mean, or whatever yeah sure my, my thoughts is that um similar to a lot of items that we have on our budget and on our strat strategies the money's there doesn't mean we're going to go spend it tomorrow um and so as i mentioned the vision session it, it was not necessarily about the, the the feasibility study but it was about as a council to show the important the critical priority that we want to put to our staff to understand as a council that it is very important that we pursue any and all options with this city center that we're working on and we don't let it pass 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 up on us. That's my opinion on your to your uh, okay. question. Okay, because when you do a research viability, when you do a feasibility study, which is actually what it said for the development of the FY22 budget, okay, uh, except it was a lower priority. I, I'm just we're we're giving staff direction on what we want them to go do to start working developing the FY23 budget. That's what this document really is, is here's our priorities, start, start funding those priorities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to figure out what we're telling staff, because we're not telling them, we want you to go do a feasibility study. We are telling them, go work, you know, it doesn't need, need to be a critical priority, although I think it is, to tell them go work with stakeholders to sure. work on this this idea so is there something in the mayor's mind or in your mind that is a concrete next step or maybe we ask our developers what's the next what's the concrete 
next step other than talk to publics. I got that, but well, that's the, not what the, the staff. The first is concrete doing. next step is for you to go to Atlanta. Okay, okay, okay. with them. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we're, 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 that that is the next concrete yeah. step is to share our vision or idea with the owners of the land. That'll probably be the next concrete step. Uh, the timeline on that soon. We don't want to tarry. That's why we got you guys scheduled to go and take a look uh, at a development in, in the first part of April. Um, as far as I don't care where this thing is on on the list. I just want it on the list because it, it just needs to be explored. And, and in this fiscal year, 2022, we may run into a wall and it might be over. Okay. okay? But if it's not, we'll take it into fiscal year 23. And, and go from there, if, if that sounds good with you. Uh, you know, so uh, I'm, I don't foresee any true expenditures happening in 2022 on this yet. I think it's gonna be, a, or 2022, you know, you know, outside of what we have budgeted for this idea now, but going into the 2023 budget cycle, uh, I think we have time if, if this is gonna go beyond where, this stage here. Oh, it, it, it would take it, take it from there. I'll be on the other side of the podium by then. So that's something I'm that the council. So, 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 so the next concrete step outside of the, the, the going up there to, to gather the vision will be to, to get in front of the people that own the land and start sharing our vision and then see it from there. I foresee us forming a committee, uh, not just of the council committee because we get to make all the decisions anyways but forming a, a finding committee of, of you ask for champions find some champions that are going to help walk this process it's a thousand moving parts it's over my pay grade most of us here too and and, and start putting together a group that, that that will carry the ball just like what happened the only reason we have Destin high school is because that's what they did they took their dream and their vision and got the right people around them to make it come to complete to completion. I foresee any type of project of this scale magnitude will require the same thing. It'll require passion and effort and energy and money, of course. Uh, otherwise, it'll die on the vine. So uh, priority wise, one, two, one, three, one, seven, one, eight. I don't care if it's on the back of the paper. I just want it on there so we can go forward. I'm fine with Okay, so, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Destin. It's we're we're leaving at one point two, which is suggested. We're making it one point two. Is that the motion? Moving up to one point two. Yeah, but we're not directing this, the staff at this time to spend a whole lot of money on it until we know. That's correct. Okay. Well, I don't have a problem with that, but I can, I can tell you what the price that the developer is going to ask to work with us. It's about a thousand. Uh, residential units and if that's what we think we should do that's the way it'll go um, I'm not sure that's the solution to our problems in downtown Destin right now so that's well, a decision to be made well, if we don't later date. if we don't do anything with the way that place is owned we could get multifamily units there anyways uh, so the question is how many well, that's true that, but yeah, uh, that'll be negotiation ho hopefully we could take up enough land there's not enough room for that that would be a wonderful outcome, wouldn't it, Mayor? Uh, yes, it would be, and it's my goal personally, actually. Lance. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on uh, some additional clarification for staff. Um, just the intent, make sure that I heard it correctly. Consensus not to move forward with feasibility study until directed to do so by council. Is that correct? Right. I'm going to help you out as soon as I make my motion. <laughs> Kevin. Yeah. I was just going to finish if, and just to reiterate, Jim, I know you don't have an issue with it and, you know, a specific item and, and Mayor jokes about it doesn't matter what number it is and all that, which it's funny, but at the same time, our staff takes this and does it. Yeah. So if it sits down there as 1.6 and 1.7, they, they could just keep as desirable so it's just it's it's important and i don't know what happened in 2005 and 2006 or whatever y'all were talking about maybe it was these same discussions and the mayor at the time or whoever wasn't as passionate or we didn't have a champion but you know i, I 
my idea of changing it, putting it up higher is as I was with the mayor saying, and it's, it is, I feel that our city, citizens, businesses, visitors, this is a critical point that we have a buyer, Publix, who has bought it, I guess bought it, and we have an opportunity to step up to the plate to closer than we've ever been on that, on that parcel. And so I just want to exhaust any and all options, especially since it doesn't cost anything to do it, so the staff knows, but that's all I wanted to add. All right. Any further discussion on the motion to second? Let's take a vote. Jim, you'll be right up next for your motion. I have it so moved. Jim? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to bring back a budget amendment to move $75,000 that has been budgeted in FY22 and to, for the feasibility study and put it in council contingency uh, for the remainder of FY22. Second. Got a motion, got a second. Any further discussion? You got any problem with that, staff? Crystal? Any? I got it. Sounds good. Okay. Eyes have it. So moved. Thank you, Jim. Time out. <laughs> Time for a break. Five minutes. Oh. <laughs>
Just a friendly reminder, mute your cell phones. I should have said that at the beginning of the meeting. Don't be that guy or girl. It's usually me. All right, everybody take a seat. We'll get right back at it. Waiting on Mr. King. Lance can go. He He's coming, Lance can go. All right. It's already 9.05, so uh, we got a lot of work to do here, so let's just get after it. Go ahead. Thanks, sir. Uh, next up, we've got Mr. Jeff Ling. I appreciate his patience tonight of Evergreen Solutions, who um, was in charge of conducting our compensation study. And Jeff has got a brief presentation to, to bring the council and then he'll answer questions. Forgot to push the button. I appreciate the invitation to be with you this evening. I do have a short presentation to give you an update on the compensation classification study that our firm Evergreen Solutions has been conducting over the last several months with the city of Dustin. Uh, we wanted to touch very briefly on the study goals, what we were commissioned by your staff to uh, do over the last several months, talk about the project phases, the step we went through in completing the work, talk about the employee meetings. Your employees had a chance to meet with our staff to identify issues of concern that they might possess, provide suggestions or recommendations for how the city can be more competitive, talk a little bit about the current system review. Uh, what are the mechanics of what you have today? What's working? What could be improved? Talk about the survey. We did survey some peer organizations throughout the state of Florida and then talk about the next steps. And so we'll be visiting with you again uh, on overall results uh, in the coming weeks, I believe. This study overall looked at two facets. The first facet being internal equity or the idea that if I perform similar work to someone else within the organization, even if I don't work in the same department or possess the same title, am I compensated in a similar manner? The idea being not so much if someone else makes $15 an hour that I make $15 an hour, but we have the same earning potential if we're performing similar work. The second component is what would I make if I left the city of Dustin? Would I make more money, less money, or the same money that I make here? So external equity is much more concerned with what the external market is doing and how my skills or capabilities would be rewarded as an employee. Then based on combining those two elements together, we look for areas for improvement. Uh, we attempt to maximize equity, uh, fairness, as well as your competitiveness as an organization. We all know it's a pretty tough time right now with hiring employees. Uh, we know that in some ways it's, it's an unprecedented time. And so we took particular interest as well in what your patterns were on recruitment and retention and how that might change in the future. We went through four phases in order to look at your current situation as well as to identify recommendations. The first being outreach. And this is really an opportunity to talk with your employees, them to identify what their concerns might be. In addition, as part of that, they were asked to fill out a survey about their job that identified what they do on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis, as well as to answer a series of standardized questions that relate to the complexity of their work, the relationships they have to maintain, the working conditions they're working within, individuals that they provide leadership to, uh, as well as the decisions that they make on a regular basis. We analyze that information in phase two, or the classification component. What we're looking for there is, do you have the right titles? Do you have a career path? Do you have work organized in a manner that is efficient and effective uh, from a human resource standpoint? And the second part of that really being to take a look at uh, where are those discrepancies or holes and how might they be addressed? Uh, Destin is a small to mid-sized uh, organization, meaning that you're not going to have a career path that has 10 levels of accountant. You're not going to have eight levels uh, in your legal department. You're not going to have seven levels in your HR department. So each of these analyses that we do in phase two is really geared toward the size and complexity of the organization that we're working with. In phase three, we look at compensation. That's the external equity component. What we're concerned with there is what would I make if I work somewhere else? What is your overall market position? How do you improve that market position to align with what's going on within the marketplace? Uh, this group or this body asked us to look at benefits as well. So we included the benefits analysis as part of that. Although we collected data on the availability of benefits, a particular interest I know of this body uh, based on my previous meeting with you was the value, the cash value of those benefits. And so we did look very closely at what, on average, the cash value would be of benefits here vis-a-vis -vis in some of your peers that we compared you to. And the last piece is really where do you go from here or the solution? What are the options that are available to you? And there's not a holy grail. There's not one solution that addresses every local government. Uh, Evergreen does an extensive amount of 
work with local government, uh, not only here in Florida, uh, but in 41 other states. And so we do a lot of this work for local governments. Uh, but what we do in one place doesn't necessarily work for you. And so we've been working with your staff on several different alternatives to look at uh, to potentially address. I'll, I'll talk about those this evening, uh, what we found as part of the study. What's coming next is really reporting. This is an interim update for you. There will be a detailed report that summarizes each of the steps we went through as well as the recommendations that will be forthcoming. So what did employees tell us? What did they have to say? Uh, there are four things that they mentioned that were positive, and we asked two questions. One question of what brought you to the city and why do you remain with the city uh, as an employer or as an employee with an employer, and number one was benefits. They expressed a strong interest and support for the level of benefits that are provided. I can tell you in most jurisdictions, benefits are in the top three among public employees. Uh, second being culture. This is an organization that has a very strong culture, and that's something, again, we have the luxury of uh, traveling throughout the country uh, and meeting with local governments as far away as the West Coast and as far north as Maine, and we interact with a lot of employees. And your employees here are much more positive than typically we encounter. They're much more confident in your leadership, the leadership of the senior management, uh, and the type of family-oriented organization that you developed over time and you provided leadership to. Uh, the location. Many employees indicated where else would be a better place to live than here. And so many indicated that working close to home, living in this community, being a very positive community, a good place to live as well as to work was something that came up time and again in those meetings as well. And the last piece really being the flexibility of scheduling, that the hours fit their work, uh, life balance, that it's something that is taken into account and it aligns well with what their needs would be. And we're finding, especially uh, since COVID, that this is a more and more important factor, uh, as the mayor mentioned, uh, with telework and with the competition that telework has brought, that work-life balance is a strong predictor as well of people remaining with an organization. What are some of the concerns that your employees expressed? Uh, I can tell you in, in doing this work almost 30 years, external equity is always in the top one or two. Uh, we never work with anyone that says we're overpaid. Go back and tell the council that or tell the commission that. Um, so uh, external equity uh, was the number one concern that, that the market has really left behind. Um, in essence, the pay practices that are present within the city. Um, and that is something we're encountering many places. Uh, again, your employees are not alone, and, and I'll talk in a few moments about what the data revealed in regards to competitiveness, but that was a principal concern. Bread, milk, gasoline is becoming more expensive. It's costing more for housing. This region has done very well in appreciation in housing over the last, really in, in for many years, but especially in the, these COVID years. Um, and as a result, uh, there was quite a bit of concern about eventually I'll be priced out of living in my community where I work. You know, so in essence, I can't live here and work here. I'll have to live somewhere else and commute here for work or for employment. Internal equity really related more to moves within certain departments. And uh, some of this was a function or some of this, the examples that came about with the internal equity discussion really related to jobs moved at different rates even before COVID. We know that not all boats float up at the same rate, in essence, that IT has been very, very competitive, even one supervisor within that department. And so that was a concern as well, that there needs to be sufficient professional development to move up in the organization, even with the limited number of opportunities that are present in a smaller organization. With your current system, there were a number of strengths uh, that we found. The city has moved employees through their pay ranges over time. Uh, this is usually a weakness within many public employers. What you'll find is a large number of the employees are all concentrated in the first quartile, meaning they all make around the minimum and they don't really move through that pay plan over time. Uh, city Dustin has done a better job of addressing that than many of your peers. Uh, we found that uh, not a significant number of employees are at the minimum, and there's two artifacts that create that, one being you have high turnover, so I'm always hiring, so I always have people at the minimum, and the art other artifact being I don't give raises as an organization, so people cluster at the bottom. And we found the presence of neither, so that would be a strength within your current system and your current plan. City is clean and easy to understand pay plan. It's relatively uh, intelligible to your employees. Uh, there's some places that we work, employees tell us we have no idea how we end up being paid what we're paid. We have no idea how we increase in pay. We have no idea how anything works. Your employees are at the opposite extreme of that. What they shared with us is we understand the system, we understand how it works, uh, we understand uh, the pay practices utilized by the city. Some of the weaknesses, about three quarters of your employees are in the top uh, half of their current pay ranges. 
Uh, so this is typically a sign of one of two things. It means either your range is too short or too narrow, or it means that you have long-term employees that have become stuck over time, that they can't move up, or it means that your organization is not kept pace with the market. And so what that results in many times is I move people through the range because my range is not market responsive. So I need people higher and higher in the range so I can get a little bit closer to what the market value for that person would be. Uh, the other being is there is some compression. Uh, compression is something, as you can imagine, very discouraging to morale. Uh, two types of compression. One type is uh, rank compression. That would be the idea that my supervisor and I are too close together in what we're paid. And that creates the disincentive for someone to become a supervisor. I think about, well, with the headaches that go along on managing people, I'm not going to make that much more money. I think I'm going to stay where I'm at. I don't want to move up. Uh, we didn't find as much rank compression here within Dustin. That, that wasn't a problem. The other type of compression, which is usually a little bit more prevalent, is range compression. And that's if two people work in the same job, one has more time in that job than the other, and the person with less time makes roughly the same as the person with more time. And so that's the idea that the city wouldn't be recognizing my contribution over time and moving me through the range. Again, it's not overly pronounced. Uh, your rank compression is very low. Your range compression is relatively low. Uh, but there are some cases of uh, people being too close together based on time. And many times that occurs in a hyper-competitive market. So what ends up happening is I need to hire people. I need to get them in the door. They're not coming on for what I'm offering. So I offer them more, progressively more. And this happens a lot at the lower end of your pay plan as well. So I need to get individuals in that are groundskeepers. I need to get people in to work on HVAC. I need to get people in that will be custodians. But they won't come for what I'm offering because I have too much competition. And so I progressively increase that hiring rate. And when I do, they get a little too close to people that have been doing that job for a while. And so you do have some of that present within your system currently. When we looked at the market, uh, we went out and we did a dual approach. Uh, so we utilized some local competitors as well as we use some regional or our statewide competitors. Uh, and doing that, uh, many times that transition in a local government from just using the local market to using a regional market is the type of economy or the type of uh, approach it takes strategically uh, with, as an organization. And so organizations that are okay with being at, at the middle of the pack or basically being uh, at the middle of the pay range or the middle of their local market will adopt a very local approach to their salary survey. And meeting with your staff, discussing the salary survey options with them in your compensation philosophy, time and again, your employees, your senior staff indicated, Destin is a destination of choice. It is, we not only attract people, obviously here locally, uh, I live in Tallahassee, my wife and I come over here regularly, but I'm probably not your target demographic as, as a tourist. You're drawing throughout the entire Southeast and you have to have the quality of services that go along with not only people relocating here from other areas within the country, but also tourists from other parts of the country. And so as we had that conversation, uh, we chose to adopt an approach that not only included local competitors, but also organizations that are similarly situated or have similar strategies from an economic standpoint. And so you have other beach communities, if you will, around the state that we selected to compare you to. It's important to note we recognize the cost of living is different. Uh, your cost of living will not be the same as Marco Island. It will not be the same as Naples. It is actually a little bit less expensive here than it is in either of those locations. And so we use a standard economic uh, multiplier that can be utilized to put dollars into the same jurisdiction's dollars. And it would be no different if you went online and we talked about Atlanta tonight or there was some discussion of Atlanta. If you wanted to know I make $40,000 in Destin, how far does that go in Atlanta? If I live in Metro Atlanta, it's the same type of methodology that's utilized to put it into Destin dollars so that we can make those comparisons. So although we report the raw data of what your peers told us, we also report those dollar adjusted dollars uh, that takes into account the cost of living differential between those different areas or those different jurisdictions. Our principal concern looking at your 62 jobs are the ranges. So our principal concern is what is the minimum and what is the maximum that's paid the earning potential. We do ask questions about average actual, but the average actual pay has a lot of variables in it. It has variables for what the budget was in those jurisdictions which year, how new their workforce is, how much turnover they've had, if they have a performance and a uh, merit performance and a market adjustment that they give each year. So our principal concern is many times the ranges. 
that we look at because there's too many variables that go into what individual incumbent pay would be in these other jurisdictions, although we do collect it to share with you. Uh, here's what we found. These are the overall results with the market. Again, these are taking into account the ranges. The left-hand side is the unadjusted, so the numbers without the cost of living taken into account. The right-hand side would be with the cost of living taken into account. And so you're roughly about 19% behind at min, mid, uh, and max uh, when we don't adjust for cost of living or the difference between the dollars here and the dollar in the other jurisdictions. You're about 17, 16 to 17% when we adjust for cost of living. A good rule of thumb uh, is basically 3% is the margin of error. And so 3% is enough that as an employee, I probably don't make a move. I don't make a change in my employer. I don't uproot my family and uh, move somewhere else. Um, once you get outside of 3%, really that zone between about 3 and 10% is you will begin to feel some of that impact uh, on recruitment and retention. Uh, once you're beyond 10%, then you really begin in st certain strategic positions or hard to fill positions, you will have a more limited candidate pool or you will have your highly qualified people begin to be a little bit more aggressive in the shopping that they do uh, for other employment. Um, we did take into account uh, the benefits. Uh, so the, again, coming back to your charge to us, and there is a little bit of a float. There's about a plus or minus 1%. Uh, that is impacting your cost of benefits in comparison to your peers. Um, most Florida local governments have standardized their benefits, meaning they, they use that as part of their value proposition. So when they go out to a potential employee, they want to have a very generous benefits package to attract that employee versus the private industry and private industry's higher wages. And so there's quite a bit of consistency, at least in the dollar value of the benefits. Uh, I'll share with you next time where there are some differences in your offerings, or some difference in the offerings, but when you get down to dollars and looking at dollars, you're very, very close uh, to what the peers are doing in regards to dollars that we compared you to. Some of the differentials, if they're on FRS or they're not on FRS, uh, some of the differences in the health coverages, some slight differentials that exist in the premiums, who's paying the employer versus the employee. Again, we'll visit about that again in the future, but from an overall dollar standpoint, many times, and I think wisely so, you were interested in seeing if your benefits move your competitive position. It really doesn't dramatically move your competitive position one way or the other, based on the data we collected. So what are we recommending? We are recommending that you adopt a new pay plan. And so we're recommending that you keep the positive elements of your current pay plan, but you do implement a new pay plan, uh, that it does possess consistent range spreads, which yours possesses that now. That's simply the distance between the minimum and maximum. You're, we're recommending you keep the best practices that you have in place in that regard. We are recommending that it's comprehensive in the sense that it covers all jobs, that's a single plan for all jobs, that you don't develop separate plans for different jobs. And we are recommending that then the classifications be placed within that plan and the individual employees be placed within that plan. And so that everyone would be within the new plan and it would be a market responsive plan. In essence, it would take into account the data that we collected as part of this process. Question that I can promise you will come up from your employees and probably some of you have is, well, we're in this dynamic market. We're in this market where literally we collect data one quarter and the next quarter the data is slightly different. Um, we are recommending that you implement something that is slightly ahead of the data that we collected, only because, and I'll show you that slide in a few moments, only because we know that the current labor market we're in is not ending this quarter or next, or we have a pretty good idea. I guess what's occurring uh, in Eastern Europe may, could change that, and the price of oil could obviously change that. But short of those impacts, most economists are predicting <clears throat> we have at least two more quarters of the same labor market, short of those events that are occurring. <clears throat> excuse me, within Europe. So we are recommending two approaches for consideration by staff <clears throat> on how to place employees within that market, excuse me. One approach would simply keep me at the same placement versus my peers as I possess as a, in your current system. So the compa ratio takes a ratio between my current pay and the midpoint within my pay range. And it, in essence, indexes me to the same percentile that I'm uh, at currently. So if I'm at the midpoint on a compa ratio approach, I'd be at the midpoint in the new structure. If I'm at the 25th percentile, basically I'm going to be at the 25th percentile in the new structure. The capped at midpoint or the compa ratio to midpoint would limit the increases or the placement to those up to midpoint and below. 
And so in essence, it would concentrate on those that make the least amount of money within P each pay range and those that would stand in essence many times to gain the most from an implementation like this. And so two ap approaches, one approach, again, everyone ends up where they're at now from a percentile standpoint, basically. The other approach says that's only going to happen for those that make the midpoint or less. Again, keep in mind, as I shared with you before, you do have a significant number of people that are above the midpoint. So they're pretty deep in their range already. Uh, you've already been attempting to address them with the current tools that you have. And so option number two would limit uh, the dollars that are being allocated to those that are above the midpoint. And so many times local governments will adopt that uh, as an alternative to keep the costs a little bit more manageable and also to try to help those that make the least amount of money within their organization currently. Uh, with the market position or the proposed market position, as I mentioned, um, when we compare what we're recommending to where you would be versus the market data that we collected, you would be about 1.5% uh, ahead of the minimum. So you would have a slight 1% advantage on your peers on average. You'd be 4.6% ahead at the midpoint, and you would be 6.4% ahead at the maximum. Why that's important is for most projections, most local governments in this year will do in their budget 4 to 6%. So in essence, since this is forward looking, you're not implementing this today, we've built in a little bit of that float uh, to keep you up with the Joneses, so to speak, uh, as they're doing their same deliberations right now and looking at what they will roll out. So we're not back in the, in the days, the banner days of the 90s where most local governments were doing 7 to 9% or even 10%. We're not back there again. Uh, but we're clearly in a time period in which there is considerable movement, not only because the amendment that passed with the minimum wage and the response to the minimum wage change, but also the hyper-competitiveness that has come about because of the COVID economy or, or what's occurred uh, at the end of it. Uh, in essence, as we're phasing out the impact of COVID. Uh, some classifications will move more or less. So keep in mind, not all classifications were the same percentage behind. Some were doing better, some were doing worse. And so we were, are recommending a very targeted approach in that regard. So it's not an across the board. We're not recommending everyone moves the same amount or that you simply give a 6% or 8% or whatever the case might be, which some of your peers will be doing this year. We're recommending that's much more laser focused in what you're doing. What are the next steps over the course of this month? Uh, we'll be working on those alternatives and selecting an alternative. Uh, I believe I'll be meeting uh, with each of you uh, to discuss the alternatives and, and to have individual meetings. Uh, we'll be working on how to communicate the alternatives. So again, what, what we work on with you will be communicated to staff. Uh, we'll be also addressing any concerns or any questions that come up, uh, as well as working with Crystal, uh, as well as Nicole, on what the rollout would look at look like uh, when you do move forward with an alternative. Uh, we will submit, again, the written report. Next time I visit with you, we'll be reviewing that written report that will summarize each of the steps, summarize what data we used. You'll be able to look at the breakdown by job of what we found. You'll be able to look at benefits literally by what type of health insurance is offered, what are the average premiums by health insurance. And so uh, next time I'll need a little bit more of your time uh, in order to go through that information. And then beginning in April, uh, we'll work on your new class specifications. And so your employees were good enough to tell us what they were doing on a regular basis. We'll update that information, uh, taking into account what they shared with us. Uh, we'll work with Nicole to do some training on how to maintain the system. And then uh, we'll begin transferring everything over to you in the month of April. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Bagley. So here's the questions when we sit, you and I sit down, uh, I would like to discuss uh, the value of the benefits. You're, you're, this said plus or minus 1% with our peers. I'm not sure I buy that, but I, okay. I, I just want to see what our peers are offering versus what we're offering, uh, both the health benefits the 457 plan and the thrift plan. Uh, the three quarters of the employees that are above the midpoint, is that because of longevity or, and if, you, if you're not absolutely certain, you don't have to answer any of these questions tonight, just when we sit down okay. one-on-one, I'm just gonna have the same sheet and we'll go down it. That sounds good. Uh, the peer groups, uh, you and I briefly discussed this. You know, where would our people go? They'd go to Oklahoma County, they'd go to Fort Walton Beach, they'd go to Walton County, they might go to Panama City Beach, you know, Niceville, someplace where they could commute or they're already living. 
potentially. And then, yes, a few regional, you know, New, New Smyrna Beach, uh, Fernandina Beach, those are similar communities to what we have here, high tourism things. So um, I would like to look at that pure set as what we're, where we are, I guess, relative to them. Uh, and then the uh, cost, total cost of what, and you may have to work with Nicole and Crystal of what you're proposing, not just, well, it's the 1% here and this person's going to move. What does this whole transition look like? I mean, because, you know, we, we had a discussion about city managers raise and I, I mentioned I gave all my people two raises last year and two bonuses because they stayed and I didn't lose anybody. And so, you know, sometimes you have to do things like that. And I just want to know what the, what the total cost is going to be. Thank you. Teresa. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the same lines as Mr. Bagley, so I would like to discuss those too. But I would also like to know if when you were in conversation with some of the um, employees that you were interviewing, were some of those candid with you and said, oh, I've already took a job, you know, in Fort Walton or in, you know, Marianne, wherever, somewhere else, because they're going to pay me $7 more an hour to do the same exact thing that I've been doing here for the last four years? To answer your question, the, all of the discussions we had with employees would have been in a group. So uh, many times there's hesitancy to say, I've taken another job somewhere else in that setting, but th there were a number of employees that had done research into either out of an interest in leaving or out of an interest in just presenting information uh, indicating that your peers were paying more. So yes, there, there, uh, in the age of the internet, it's very easy to find that out. You know, in the old days, they would have had to go to a newspaper or, or, or call the jurisdiction. I've, I've done this long enough to remember those days. Um, today, it's, it's a few seconds on their phone and they can tell you, you know, my position starts $3 more per hour at Fort Walton or, or at Panama City. And so, yes, there, there was definitely a, a good level of understanding of where Dustin is versus your peers. They, they did have that knowledge and, and they did bring that up. But, but I don't recall anyone, and I didn't conduct all the sessions. I sat in on some, but, but staff conduct, that worked for me conducted most of them. Um, I don't remember anyone saying I've already accepted another position, but I do know as we've gone through and, and worked on the project with the city, uh, Nicole has had to update the data regularly for your turnover. And so if you don't have turnover, we can keep the same database in essence through most of the study. Um, that's not been the case here. Well, that was my question is, is because I personally have had staff tell me, you know, well, you know, got a lot of great training here, but I can make four more dollars an hour going somewhere else. And I'm like, have you tried to at least negotiate and get more money? And yeah, the city said they're capped out. So is that ever the case where you're at other places whenever you're trying to find out there, you know, is it a city budget issue or is it just lack of knowledge that their employees are going to take the money and run if they can get it? It, it does vary by jurisdiction. Uh, there are philosophical caps that some jurisdictions possess that, that are not market responsive. Um, there, there are some, again, Evergreen works in a lot of different markets. We work in some markets where last year they had 45% of their staff walk out. Uh, I, I was in Maryland last week and the entire IT department of one local government quit on the same day. They all went to two employers on the same day. Um, and, and they all put in their notice at the exact same time. So I flew there to meet with them to say, okay, what are you gonna do to staff your IT department? Uh, because everyone left. Um, there's, there's several clients we're working with now here in Florida that most of the engineers uh, are gone. That, there, that uh, one or two employers picked off most of their engineers. Um, and, and so that's, uh, yes, the, the, there's, there's definitely different approaches that are being adopted. Uh, some are, are doing their very best to raise pay, but it's not in enough time. You know, they're, they're not able to respond in time. And, and I was at, uh, at a meeting put on by the city of Bunnell, uh, again, very small jurisdiction. They had the state economists there and they, they invited me to, to 
I guess, speak uh, to talk with the state economists uh, to the, their elected officials for the city. And the state economists did a very, very insightful presentation of showing that with the great resignation here in Florida, so the impact specifically in our state, that many of the people that left, they've already left again. So they might have left public employment, they've gone to private, they're going on to their next private employer now. And so he, and he showed the impact on wages for those individuals within the state. And I had, that was the first time I had seen that. Um, and, and it was very, very insightful to show that, especially the multiple movers, they have significantly increased their wages uh, since really 2021 really last year into this year. And so uh, I, I think many are scrambling to respond and uh, they're doing the best that they can. I, I think many are experiencing private sector competition from everyone from Whole Foods to Publix to, um, and so that, that's the other counter that, that's part of this that the public sector many times cannot move as quickly as private industry. Um, Thank you for that, and thank you for the study. My last question is, do you ever recommend that they do like Maxwell's, the Strength Finders, or Brex and Higgs? Do you ever encourage employers, when you hire somebody, make them fill this out? Then you can learn right off the bat, if this person is an introvert, they're going to be way better on, you know, phone than they are at the front right. desk. Um, because I feel like sometimes, we at the city have mismatched some of our employees because when I talk to them, they're like, well, if they, you know, I could really do that job, but, you know, I make better money doing this job. So I always wonder if we could have beat that loss of that employee because we've placed them properly to start with. That's a very good question. And um, I, I'll cite an example of another government here in Florida that did that. Uh, Lakeland, city of Lakeland at one time had career centers. And so you would go, come, when you became an employee or at the time of employment, you would test right through the assessment center and they would try to navigate, if you will, or, or encourage people not to pursue the high skill, high wage if they didn't have the competencies or capabilities to do that, but to pursue those that better aligned with, with their capability. That's not as pronounced in Florida as it is in some other states where, where that's been when that's been adopted a little bit more um, it comes in and out of favor o over the last several decades there was a real push especially in the 90s in that regard in the 2000s people kind of pulled back again I, I think you'll see that returning I think you're, you're definitely ahead of your time if, if something like that's put into place because it is coming back where the, the question of have we just misaligned people and we know from research on engagement and on satisfaction, if I don't have good alignment with my job, it's one of the three primary factors of why I leave. And so, and that's 20 years of research still points to that, that if I end up in a job that, that doesn't align with my skill set, besides not liking my boss and not liking my coworkers, it's number three behind those. So it's very important. And then my last question is, when it comes to management um, over employees, the same kind of testing that goes on to make sure that the manager knows this is your number spreading guy and this is your huggy guy and this right. is your you know emotional support. You need to stroke them and they'll give you 150%. They don't need more money. They just need to be acknowledged. Do, do they see that as being incorporated as well, um, coming back into the reason why people will leave because they're not being, quote, stroked the right way mm -hmm. by their mm -hmm. employer or their immediate boss. That, that has become, that has definitely become a front burner issue pre-COVID. So from 2017 to 2019, that was, that was coming to the forefront that we can't manage all people the same, not all people respond to the same type of feedback, or the same type of criticism, then COVID hit. And now that's even more in the forefront with the turnover that's occurring because employees, yes, they are leaving for money. That, 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 that is, when they're being surveyed, why did you leave? Money is on the list, in, in the top part of the list. But quite a few are leaving because they felt like there wasn't a strong response uh, from their organization to what they needed during COVID, which is the root is what you're describing, that in essence, I'm not interfacing uh, and we did uh, a study recently with Florida State University where we looked at that, not among public, but among private employers, because that was the interest of the university. And we found that there is a significant number of people that left 
in 2020 to mid 2021 for the very reason you're naming that I needed to hear something different from my boss when COVID was happening and I didn't hear it. Mr. Destin. Yeah, and that was part of one of the questions I was going to ask the employees that I've spoken to. It's not so much money. It's in, in a number of instances, they just don't think they can do the work they've been assigned. There's too much of it. And that's a that's a you know situation where we need to have some more employees. And the uh, the other question I was going to ask is, you had 12 responses. Was that 12 employee responses on the survey, or is, did I read that wrong? That, that was 12 peers. So I'm sorry. We had 12 peers. So 12 outside organizations participated okay. in, in the so survey. So how many how many of our employees out of 100 or so did we get to talk to? I don't have that number with me. I, I, I want to say it was close to 40 percent, but okay. please don't hold me to that. Uh, but we had a much higher response rate on the survey. Um, the, the survey was much higher, and I believe it was closer to 75, 80 percent that participated in well, the survey process. And, and that's comforting. The only other observation I would have is, you know, we all want to pay our employees what it takes to get them to stay and be happy with their job. But I guess this is directed at uh, finance. We need to find a reoccurring revenue source that we're going to use to pay this because we can't take it out of fund balance or somewhere else. If we don't have a reoccurring finance source, then we are going behind and we're setting uh, ourselves up for failure a few years from now. So we need to be looking at where the money will come from for this once you have told us what the actual amount is. So I would encourage us to try to figure out how we will pay for this. We've already done 5% plus 3% merit, which costs us about 800000 or somewhere in that neighborhood. We have a bunch of vacancies that are very $5 people. Right, right. And, and of course, our goal is to fill those vacancies because we have complaints that they have too much work to do. So if, so if we get to the, the point that we actually fill the vacancies to have the people to, to do the work that they can possibly do, then we're back to we need to find some new we need to earmark some revenue that will go go to this and that's all i have thanks mr wagner did we gauge workload kind of stemming off that was there a workload balance question there was not okay and so when we do the calculations on compensation we don't typically include workload okay we use a different tool set for doing that gotcha um so that employees were asked to divide up the time, how much ever time they spend, into 100%. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, sometimes employees will say, well, I feel like I work 150. We encourage them, well, even if you do feel like you work 150, divide it into 100% pie mm -hmm. to, to give us an idea of what tasks you're involved in. Or what gotcha. You're doing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Time for some more caffeine. Lance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, next up, we have uh, Mr. Mark Porter um, from Utility Consultants of Florida online to give us a brief update of where he's at. And we are also looking for Council's approval to execute um, the next agreement with Mark. Mark, can you hear us okay? I can. Thank you, Lance, and good evening, Mayor and Council members. I hope everybody and or each of you are doing well. Um, as the may Mayor had alluded to earlier, I'll try to do the KISS version, the acronym that I understand that is uh, keep it simple and short. So um, I feel that we've got a lot of positive progress over the um, past several months, the coordination between the key stakeholders. I think it's put us in a really good place as we move forward. As you know, the field inventory of that aerial inventory schematic has been completed. It's part of that uh, recent opinion of probable cause for phase one. Um, we've had several ongoing meetings and discussions with FPL for the upcoming planning and design. As we move forward, the recent um, engineering deposit that's included in a task order uh, will be a major catalyst on advancing the project by starting that critical design. Um, the scope also includes survey to support that FPL design. Um, that design will also serve as a critical platform for the carers to begin their layouts and design as well. So we're working with them. Um, 
We'll also, in the coming months, need to bump up some efforts with FDOT to ensure that the project planning takes into consideration any key factors, any upcoming or advanced projects, as well as county and, and city projects as well, including the water um, and sewer department. There'll be several field assessments during the FPL's design. We'll wanna start getting a better picture into the easement locations. We know that's gonna be pretty critical um, here coming up, so we can kind of get a jump on that and start. Um, once that design is complete from FPL, we'll go ahead and redline any required changes and kind of finalize that. That'll include some of those easement locations. And then we'll receive what they call a binding cost estimate, a BCE. Um, at that time, I'd be more than happy to kind of come in and explain that uh, the details and information it outlines. There's a tariff section 12 kind of talks to that, the credits, how they're applied. We did kind of talk to that briefly in the original opinion of probable cost, but when that, when that comes or if there's questions on that, more than happy to um, help out as much as I can with that. And then um, we'll also, as that FPL design is in the works, we'll be working with city staff to begin the procurement process. We would recommend some um, prior projects that have they've gone extremely successful. They've been very cost efficient for that type of a um, project delivery method. And then we'll also want to work with city staff to provide some street street light options back to council, um, some, some options that you might have with that. And then, of course, probably one of the most important things is um, look at some potential grant opportunities. So we'll continue working with staff on that. So with that, um, we know that this is a extremely high priority and just, you know, our ongoing commitment is in place to make sure that this is a rewarding and um you know very cost efficient project for the for the city so if you guys have any questions or if there's anything i can answer i'm happy to any questions for mark uh one comment get her done yeah. it we falls, will, we will. falls right in with the kiss mindset I agree. We're happy to be. Thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity. So we're okay. excited. Um, when do you think you'll come back here uh, in person to uh, give us some updates? What's your time? Whenever line? you'll have me. You let me know and I'll be there. All right. We'll work with uh, Lance. Go ahead. We do have a question here. Mr. It might be for Crystal, but I'm not sure. But uh, what was task order one amount? And when will the next task order or funding based on the schedule come tonight the next the next sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, waiting on an answer are you are you um, efforting crystal i or mark can you answer that i can so the first task order was 227 And when was that? I can't recall. That was almost a year ago. It'll be a year in a few weeks. So that was last year. And then based on the schedule, we're, we're expected for the next task to be, uh, when does the next task come? Same thing. It, it's the for the year. year. Um, I guess it would probably be beneficial to say that that original task order um, from last year did have some remaining um, funds left over. So we're using that to offset um, some of the engineering deposit for FPL and some other things like that. So we'll continue to do this thing, same thing with this task order is try to keep it in under budget. And Thank you so much. All right. You don't have to effort anymore, Crystal, I don't think on that particular one. Good. All right. Um, Jim. Mr. Mayor, I move that the city manager as execute task order two of the Destin Utility Undergrounding Project Management Agreement with Utility Consultants of Florida. Second. I have a motion of second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Ayes have it. So moved. Thanks, Mark. Thank, Thank Mark. you. Have a good evening. Um, item 4H is the adoption of Resolution 22-05, the investment the new investment policy and we have miss crystal strickland here to address this issue good evening mayor and councilman uh, so this evening we've brought before you um, a revised investment policy um, you probably saw in the agenda packet there are an awful lot of attachments so um, 
What Mr. Councilman Bagby and I have done is um, we looked to the Florida statute and looked for the gold standard in the state of investment policies and we basically took, uh, took one of these investment policies and tried to form fit it uh, to the city of Destin. So this new investment policy pretty much follows the, the Florida statute um, paragraph by paragraph where it says that we need uh, to state the objectives of safety, liquidity, and then yield. Um, we have written that into our investment policy where it says we need to, uh, anyway, it just, it just follows the, uh, the statute a lot better. Uh, and this policy is replacing some of the other um, resolutions that we've had in the past. Um, we had resolution 1212, which was investment of surplus fund dollars, which uh, defines what surplus fund dollars are. We had resolution 1304, which is the investment of city fund balance and resolution 1827, which was investment of funds for the city of Destin. So we took all of those resolutions and uh, we feel that this new uh, resolution 2205, this new investment policy um, takes all of those considerations and, and compiles them nicely into one, one new format. And uh, I am here to answer any questions you might have. And we have our friends from Raymond James here as well. Um, they, they also worked with us to help us make sure we put percentages correctly um, to the best items that we can invest our funds into. Mr. Bagby. Mr. Mayor, I move that resolution 22-05 investment policy be adopted. I second. I have a motion, I have a second. Thank you to Jim and staff and everyone working on this. Mr. Destin. Little section here that I've read that it, it talks about competitive selection of the investment manager. It says if the investment officer in consultation with the city manager or city council determines and that an investment manager is desirable, then a minimum of three qualified Bidders would be uh, contacted to ask provide bids, and they would be eventually uh, approved. My problem with that is it, the city council is the, is the only people that can approve putting out bids. So I would just change that language to say if the investment officer in consultation with the city council. Uh, I'm rather protective of the priorities and the authority of the city council. So I'll make that, unless Jim wants no, to accept I'll, it. I'll accept that. Okay, then that's, that's the only comment I had. All right, so we have a friendly amendment to the motion, basically, as, mm -hmm. as spoken. You got that right? All right, seeing no further discussion, let's go ahead and take it to a vote. Eyes have it so moved. And I just, I want to thank Crystal and I want to thank uh, Raymond James and the Eagle management folks. There was a lot of back and forth. Uh, and really it's their work that did this because it's easy for me to find a policy in another city, but it's them going, no, that's too high, that's too low, you need to move this. So I, I really appreciate all the help that y'all did. Thanks. And Brian, you can send a bill in the mail oh. for all the overtime. <laughs> See, yeah, that's 10 minutes of 10. Thank you guys for coming and being soldiers, and, and just in case you were, you're needed. But <laughs> there you go. At least I had to bring a pack of M&Ms. Yeah. All right. Okay. Troopers there. Uh, Lance, go ahead. Thanks, sir. Um, item I is uh, staff seeking council's permission to um, submit the expenditure plans to the TDC for FY22 and FY23. Um, this is related to the um, number that was agreed to um, in the interlocal with the cities uh, that was approximately 1.5 million. It's really a percentage, but we use 1.5 because everyone understands that. Um, what we will be doing with that money because um, we do have to um, do all of, all of this on a reimbursement basis and the county commission has to approve what, what we intend to spend that money on. It also includes um, next year's fiscal 23 application for the operations and maintenance of the beach 
um, parks and boardwalk areas, um, which we've been receiving from the TDC for approximately five or six years now. And uh, we received the applications uh, early last week with a deadline of March the 15th. So we apologize for rushing this through, but this is the only council meeting that we have an opportunity to to seek your approval before it, the, we hit the due date um, that was given to us by the county. All right, Mr. Bagby. Mr. Mayor, I recommend we authorize the city manager to sign and submit the proposed expenditure plans and operations funding request to the TDC for consideration by the March 15th deadline. Second. second. Got a motion, got a second, Mr. Schmidt. Crystal, what happens with these items that are already on our FY22 budget that we're now going to use this TDC funds? What happens to those items that are already on the budget? if we do this well approved. first of all this tdc money um the this is our request to the tdc and then next they take this to the uh, okaloosa board of county commissioners at their june meeting so these funds won't be available until at the earliest july and that would just be the 22 portion that we're requesting so it's uh they're not likely to replace um some of the things that we have already encumbered this year to date but um we're hopeful that if this gets approved early enough, for example, um, they allow us to uh, spend up to a certain amount towards beach access or beach purchases, that um, we'll be able to fix the timing for those purchases so that we could use this TDC money instead of the Okaloosa half penny that we did budget. So if this were the case, I would bring before you a, a budget transfer. In, in either case, after the Board of County Commissioners approves our request in June, I will be bringing that, we will be bringing that document to you with a, either a budget, well, more, more likely a budget amendment at that time to, uh, with our recommendation on the, the changes. So for example, if, um, if all these gets approved and we get more money to complete the Royal Melvin Park and Plaza project, <clears throat> but, uh, God watches over us for the next six weeks and we don't have any more change orders and we have $40,000 remaining on the current budget and now we have been approved to do this those funds can then be reallocated to something else that we have yes. asked for permission for so basically the the, these funds that we're talking about this is from the new interlocal agreement that we signed this past fall uh, this 12.5% that they've dedicated to the city of Destin doesn't go anywhere. We, we can stockpile it for a number of years and then use all of it all at once if we want. So it's, it's, use or lose, it's not use it or lose it. It's, it's ours. So if we're going to change what we're going to use it for, we just need to submit a, a change with the county and get their, um, their acceptance and their permission first. Thank you so much. All right. Any further discussion? Go ahead, take it for a vote. The fog of war. Eyes have it so moved. Thanks, sir. Four quick announcements. Um, I just want to let the council know that over 200 citizens have completed the Joe's Bayou survey um, to date, actually as of a couple days ago. So that is 100 more than what DEP was um, suggesting that they wanted in the whole thing. So please, if you're watching, go ahead and, and get your input in there. That's what we need. We need the residents. And thank input. you if you already did. Absolutely. Um, wanted to let uh, council know that I will be out the week of spring break, which is Mar March 21st through the 25th. And during my absence, the first three days, Mr. Warren will be acting city manager. And the last two days, the 24th and 25th, Mr. Zanguzzi will be the acting city manager. He promises to behave. Um, uh, Destin Forward is this Thursday, March the 10th, and I believe you all have your times for the afternoon, except for the mayor and the mayor's first thing in the morning. And finally, I did want to um, toss this over to Catherine. I did not warn her, but um, for those watching or who need additional information for either of the current surveys for the Community Development Survey or the Joe's Bayou Survey, I believe, Catherine, they can go to our city website. Is that correct? 
It is on the website. It is under the news release section. So as long as you go on to the home page, scroll down, you'll see um, Council Corner news releases, and it's the first two releases. One is the Joe's Body. The second one is the Community Development Engagement Survey. Um, also, if you go to Facebook, um, both of those links to the survey are posted. They're pinned to the very top of the page. It's also been on our Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor. And some council members have it on their Facebook page. Yes, and I appreciate every single one of you doing that, so thank you very much. That's all I have, sir. Thank you. <sighs> okay. Kyle, it's your turn. Thanks, Mayor. Only one ordinance tonight. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2203CN, an ordinance of the City of Destin of Okaloosa County, Florida, relating to the lease of certain real property owned by the city, providing for authority, providing for findings of fact, providing for City Council approval of a contract for lease of the property of Dalton Fredgill Park, and providing for an effective date. And this is a public hearing. Thanks, sir. I'm going to open up public comment on this particular first reading of Ordinance 22-03-CN. Anyone want to come up to the podium and make a comment? Seeing none, I'm going to close this portion of the hearing and we'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve Ordinance 22-03-CN on first reading. Second. Got a motion, got a second. Any further comment? Seeing none. Eyes have it so moved. <laughs> item, item six, uh, Mr. Braden had to leave. Uh, Mr. Wagner. Uh, nothing. I just think uh, what I learned tonight is Lance definitely is a huge value to us because for them being 20% under, they seem to be staying for the, the leadership. So I appreciate you. Here, here. Councilman Destin. Microphone, please. Nothing, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilwoman Abair. Nothing, Mayor. Councilman King. Nothing tonight. Thank you, sir. Councilman Schmidt. <laughs> thank you. I'll make it quick. First, I wanted to thank. I wanted to thank the uh, the local businesses, the livery vessel businesses, and owners and operators that uh, I believe pretty much successfully completed their applications, registrations on time. Uh, whether whatever day that was uh, I so I appreciate all of them for doing that so thank you so much to all of them because I, I want to have a good relationship with all of them um, number one I'm taking off I think we already talked about that worked on that with uh, staff as well number two I had uh, a family member and uh, Destin request about um, the uh, please drive slowly we love our children signs wanting to put some up in a specific location and so I have uh, asked Michael, well, I, well, what I'd like to do is throw it over to our Public Works and Safety Committee to take our four signs that we have currently in stock to look at viable options and possibly even more if we want to order more. Um, and so, Lance, can we get Michael to do this in the committee or do you want me to make a motion? Or? We can make that happen. All right. So they're going to use our Public Works and Safety Committee to hopefully get some ideas for signs. They're going to put them up in a very, very cost-efficient wet manner, and uh, I think that'll be um, – we have them on the shelves. Let's put them up because we love our children and drive slowly. So uh, that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to be here April 4th. I've got to sit on a uh, panel uh, for the National Marine Fisheries for shark predation. You know, trying to come up with some solution to uh, address the situation for sharks and marine mammals. Well, they'll also come up. And so I won't be here the 4th. Mr. Nesson, if you'll be the, um, to assume those duties of Mayor Pro Tem, I appreciate it, sir. And um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to not, uh, uh, I'm going to put the, uh, uh, Abatement issues on uh, another um, agenda item. We've, we're here long enough tonight. Uh, so uh, up next, land use attorney, Kim. Uh, I don't have anything. We have an update on some litigation that I'll call you individually about. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Kyle. Nothing here. All right. Last time up. Mike, you want to come up? And before Mr. Buckingham uh, goes.
goes on the public record. I want to personally apologize to him on the record uh, for cutting him off. Um, I uh, made an assumption I shouldn't have made, and that was things might get a little south. Uh, he assured me that was not the case. And Mike, I want to apologize to you right Thank now you. on the public record uh, and in front of the council members that I mishandled that. Thank you. And I'm going to give you, as manager of that project, as much time as you need to uh, give us an update uh, and discuss the project. I'm going to do what I was asked. Lance works for this city council. I work for Lance. I was hired to make sure a job was done by the plans and what you all are paying for. One thing that will not be taken from me is my integrity, which was attempted to be done tonight. After I was, after I was asked to come up to give you an update, just as I started, I was shut down. The mayor walked outside after I left and asked me to put my report in writing tonight, which I think was wrong, I should have been able to speak in the public, um, and then give it to him and he will relay it to you all. But I will CC you all, okay? Um, Gary, I'm not upset with you, I'm not. Um, I believe that you were asked to shut me down. There was only one person that I talked to tonight regarding my issues. Um, and I, that I was going to speak the truth, and I don't believe they wanted to hear it on public record, and it wasn't Lance, okay? I believe that I was asked to do this job because they knew that I would be honest and I would make sure that this was going to be done right. And as you all know, there's been multiple problems. Um, not to toot my horn, but I'm the one that has found them, and, and not to toot my horn, but if I wouldn't have found them, our our uh, public official back here, Noel, would be the, one of the first ones to tell you, let alone the engineers, that we'd have had a building that would have fell down and that would have failed. I'm just doing what I was told to do. And I'm doing this for free. So I, I really would like to give you guys an update. Kevin, you, you asked a few times tonight about money. And, you know, why is it, you know, change order, change order, change order? Well, I have answers for those. Um, and, I, and I think this council should know um, what those change orders are and why. And, and uh, um, I probably took this job a little too serious, but there's been so many problems with it that I made a promise to Lance that I wouldn't walk away from him, which I should have a long time ago, because it's been a pain in my ass. Um, you know, taking 40 hours of my week, every week, um, to do something for free, but I'm doing it for that man, so, and y'all. But I will get a report and I'll put it in writing and I'll make it public record. Thank y'all. City thanks you. We appreciate yes. you, Mike. Thank you. And Mike, you know, I, my, apologize, my apology to you was sincere and heartfelt, and nobody asked me to shut you down. I made an assumption to prevent things going south as chairman, and that was a mistake, and I apologize for that mistake. Okay, I just want to make sure you understand. Nobody asked me. I did that on my own accord in error. All right. Anyone else want to come on up, make a comment? Seeing none, I'm going to meeting adjourned. <laughs>